You are listening to episode 190 of My Life Radio. I am Matt Blackburn, your host, and today I'm interviewing Joe Cohen, the founder of Self Decode. So I heard about this website, Self Decode, several years ago, I think shortly after it launched in 2016. And my friend, Dr. Tyler Pansner, reintroduced me to it. And then I had him on the podcast. And he really piqued my interest in this subject of genetics. I think it's just one more piece of information to use along with blood work and other tests, saliva, urine, hair tissue mineral analysis. It's one more piece of information to use to really dial in your nutrition, your supplements, and your lifestyle. And I really do think that genetics matter. When I paid for their premium account on self decode I was really shocked going through my wellness reports how accurate it was with my symptoms. For example, more likely sinus congestion. That's absolutely true. More likely nearsightedness. I got LASIK eye surgery. I was blind for most of my life before then. Absolutely true. Increased need for vitamin A. I feel incredible on high dose retinol from cod liver oil. Higher levels of testosterone. That's absolutely true. All the blood tests I've gotten have showed that my testosterone's in the higher range, and it's pretty easy for me to maintain that. So, my experience with self decode and their analysis of gene mutations has been absolutely accurate. And I'm curious what you guys will think about it if you try it out. So, if you've ever gotten 23andMe or any ancestry, kind of website where they take your saliva and analyze your DNA, you could plug that into this website and it will look at 83 million gene mutations. And it breaks that down into digestible bits of information via the health reports and even personalized blogs, which is my favorite aspect of the website. So I'll let Joe explain it, and ahead of time, I want to apologize. I do my interviews now on Zoom, and for some reason, it stopped recording at some point and then started again, so there's going to be a little gap. So my apologies, but it caught most of the conversation. So here we go. Here is Joe Cohen. All right, Joe Cohen, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited for this one. I'm sure I'm going to learn a whole lot. Uh, I recently had my friend, uh, Dr. Tyler Pansner on the show, and he recently became a self-decode practitioner. And uh, I guess he was doing it manually for years. He said, using like Genetic Genie and other websites to help people um, with their mutations, but Uh, What's cool about what you're doing with self-decode is it's making it a lot easier where even a lay person like myself can go in and just quickly see uh, what mutations they have, whether it's with a vitamin or a mineral or even personality traits, which is really interesting to me. So uh, before we jump into all that, um, you often say that you won the genetic lottery for bad genes. That's how you got into this? Yeah, so uh, we we could start with that if you want. There's, um, you know, there's some people that I, I I I like to do interviews just even when I'm having normal conversations, and I found that there's like these these mutants. You know, they can sleep five hours, four hours. They 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 uh, can exercise eight hours a day. They can eat whatever they want. And, and they're, they're just like, you know, they're, they're fine. They got no issues and uh, they're just built like mutants. And so I was not like that. I was not built like a mutant, meaning, you know, there's a lot of things that I'm sensitive to and, you know, I have to, I have to do the work in order to be optimally healthy. It, it doesn't come, you know, I, I can't just eat whatever I want. I can't just do whatever I want. And 
I realized that what was working for other people was not working for me. I, I, I was on a long journey there just following what other people were doing and you know, just copying. I think humans are built to copy what someone else is doing. And I just said, this is not the way for me because it's just not working for me. And I could see it and, and it makes sense because you'd also see all these wars on diet and, you know, every, it was like, how many wars do you see on a diet, uh, on diet stuff? And by the way, I've, I've interviewed people who are very healthy with a vegan diet, right? I, I just the other night, and again, I'm not a, I'm, I'm, I'm more of the other side of that, right? I, I eat more of a carnivore diet, but just the, you know, this person wasn't lying to me, right? He's like, yeah, I do an Ironman. I'm like, okay, what is an Ironman exactly? Like, I never really uh, got into it. He's like, well, you, it's like 180 kilometers of running. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what he was like. like I, I don't remember the exact kilometers, but it was like a crazy amount of kilometers of running and swimming. And and uh, what was the other? Uh, I, I forgot what the other thing was, but it was just like, and I'm like, what? I'm just like, what the, you know, what the hell? And and this guy is like playing volleyball, and he's like, he's just exercising ten hours a day. And I was like, what's your diet like? He's like, I eat a vegan diet. I'm like, holy shit, this guy's eating a vegan diet, which I think is is not good for the vast majority of people, not everybody. This guy's like, he's a mutant. We've got a mutant over here. I'm like, do you ever get sick? He's like, no. Like I, I'm like, what? I'm like, what happened during COVID? He's like, I don't, I don't, I don't think I've ever gotten like I, I, I got it, but I didn't really feel anything. <laughs> it's like, what the hell is wrong with this guy? He's a mutant. And I, I've seen it wasn't only him. I've seen other people. Like I know how to identify the mutants now. They could eat whatever the hell they want, a vegan diet, just and just built like mutants. So. But for most other people, you know, the 99%, they're not built like mutants. And I would say that I had a lot of weaknesses that, you know, a lot, that, that, that are not very common in terms of my diet, in terms of all these different things. But you know what? Everybody has weaknesses, it turns out. And I don't think one of my weaknesses is, in this, is, is let's say, cancer, right? And, and a lot of people get cancer. And they seem like mutants and all of a sudden they get cancer one day. And so everybody has their own weaknesses. There's, you know, when I say won the genetic lottery, it's, it's more like I won the genetic lottery of, you know, of things that they, I was noticing that I'm affected from an early age. But you know, everybody's got their weaknesses. And that's the key is every person needs to find their weaknesses. And every person needs to optimize according to their weaknesses. So I won the, you know, the, uh, a certain genetic lottery, and it's it's about optimizing for my weaknesses. I love that. Yeah, I think we've both been in the same worlds. Like I've been into natural health for 13 years and did veganism, vegetarian, raw veganism, never did carnivore really, but I did a lot of intermittent fasting and uh, even with that, there's so many battles, right? Because there are some people that say everyone should be intermittent fasting. And then some people that say no one should ever be intermittent fasting. <laughs> and maybe the truth somewhere right, in between sure. based on your genetics, where some people need to eat frequently. And, yeah. Not even in between. It, it really depends on a lot of factors. Genetics is one of them, right? I mean, there's genetics. And then there's also what what else is going on in your life? What are you doing but definitely genetics is a big factor. There's no question about it. But also, you'll notice that a lot of people who are into fasting are also eating a high-fat diet, and fat takes way longer to break down. And so if you're eating a high-fat diet, fasting is going to be better for you, generally speaking. But guess what? I ate high-fat diets, and fasting was better for me, but still it wasn't – very good however i found ways to improve it if i wanted to but overall i'm not a big fan of, of fasting in the morning um maybe a little bit but not not much i i feel like you want to have a good meal in the morning but again that's just how i'm built 
and there, it works for people. So I'm not a person who is arrogant to say that, you know, if somebody's telling me something's working for them. I'm like, no, nah, you don't know what's working for you. I'll tell you what's working for you. <laughs> right. I, I, I and, and so I do believe people that they have uh, these, you know, that, that everybody does well with different things. And the idea is, is that you, you know, I, I've been experimenting for 15 years and, and pretty intensively and not everybody's got 15 years of experiments to do like me right uh right now for me it's more of an occupation almost so even though i have the genetic stuff I, i'm always going to be doing it because it's my occupation but this is not the occupation of everybody and even if it is i still use my genetics all the time right even though it's my occupation so what is somebody who it's not their occupation without any kind of genetic data, without any kind of personalization, like, what are they doing? They're just, you know, every, it's kind of like my mom almost, uh, she, every week she finds like a new guru that she is like, okay, this is not every week. I'd say every like three months. And she's been doing this for like 40 years. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And it's like every three months she's got like a new philosophy. I'm just like, what are you doing? And she's, you know, what, um, I don't want to name any names, but it's just like every three months is like a new philosophy. I'm just like, what is going on? Yeah, I think that's a that's a slow way to find what works for you. But if you get addicted to that novelty of the next new thing, like the next diet or the next protocol or whatever, I think that could become just like any addiction. Right? <laughs> yeah, but it also goes to show that it was, it's not working for her. Right. And, and she's just of an older generation that, you know, she's like 70. It's just like, it, it's just not, she, she, genetics is, is like very new for her. She doesn't really understand it. So it's just like, she's not, she, she's very on, she doesn't know what's going on. I would, and, and, but what's, what she's been doing for 40 years has not been working. I mean, I asked her, I'm like, has there, what have you kept in the last 40 years from all this stuff? She's literally been doing this since she was 17, uh, more than 40 years. Right. I'm like, what have you kept? And she's just like, well, basically like she kept two things. She eats, she eats like a ground up salad. She puts vegetables in a blender. <laughs> yeah and then there was like a couple other things like ginger and garlic it's like okay mainly it was ginger and 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 i'm like that's what you've gained in 40 years from bouncing around every three months to a new guru <laughs> and spending like crazy sums of money over the that time period it's just nuts it was nuts i think a lot of us that are into health the family thing's so tricky right because we love them and we spend time with them and see, you know, we might see flaws and what they're doing, you know, and it's just such an easy switch. Um, but sometimes they need to hear it from someone else. That's what I've seen. Sometimes they need to read it in an article. It can't be from me, you know, like sometimes they just need to hear yeah. it from some other person. No, I mean, the thing is she actually, uh, she, she, it does help to let, ha have other people. Right. So, she does uh, in certain ways respond to like if an MD says something or whatever. So she, she's an old school generation where she cares more about that, but she would listen to me. I feel like even if, if like I used to have a podcast and she used to listen to that, she's like, Oh, I love the podcast. You should do it again. And I just got so busy with building self decode. I, I stopped it for a long time and I'm, I'm restarting it now. I, you know, I have some episodes coming up, but, it's just like, uh, you know, she's just like, uh, you know, she doesn't really read that much and she doesn't, I don't know. It's just, um, she likes uh, podcasts and she likes following fads, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm more of an auditory learner because I have a whole bunch of books, but I seem to retain information better listening to it in a podcast or even like a lecture versus reading words on a paper. It's interesting. Interesting. I'm not sure where I retain it better. I, I think I retain it probably better uh, written. But a podcast is good because 
if you're doing other stuff, it's something that you can listen to while you're doing other stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, well, Joe, moving on to like the uh, nitty gritty details here with genetics, uh, Tyler Panzer on my show kind of went into it a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of big words, heterozygous, homozygous, and I think it could be intimidating for people getting into this because there's some terminology to kind of wrap your head around. Um, but is there like an easy way that you found to describe genetics to the person on the street? Yeah, I don't think people, you know, need to know that stuff. We built self the code so that people don't need to know exactly what heterozygous is and you know, any kind of terms per se, right? Uh, even, you know, it, it can be super complex genetics. And I think that is the, it's, 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 it's a little bit unfortunate that it's so complex because of how powerful it is. And the other thing is that because it's so complex, it's hard for somebody to discern what's legitimate in the space and what's not legitimate. And even as an expert, it took me a while to wrap my head around things and really understand what the hell is going on in the space, right? And, and that's why we had to build a platform because I got into it already in 2015. And in 2019, we started rebuilding the platform uh, because there's this thing that we found was called polygenic risk scoring. And polygenic risk scoring was something that nobody was doing in the consumer space. And there's still nobody, self decode is the only person, is the only company doing that. And so what is this polygenic risk scoring? So it came out in 2018 that they, they would do these studies on like specific variants. And most of the time they couldn't be reproduced. Meaning like you'd have a study, you'd be like, oh, this is really cool. And I was looking at it, I'm like, oh, this is great. I, I see a study. I'm like, oh, this is really cool. And then <laughs> the more you're into it, the more you see that, why can't re they reproduce any of this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's where it started to get like interesting. And it turned out that for a lot of traits, not all of them, but for complex traits, like cardiovascular disease, like mood, there's hundreds of thousands or millions of variants at play. And the only way to actually predict stuff is to look at that number of variants. Otherwise, there, there's certain traits where you don't need as many variants, but for uh, like these, these complex traits, you need a lot of variants. And we were looking at what, you know, I'm, I'm, I already thought we were way more advanced by looking at like 50 variants per report compared to other companies that were looking at like two or whatever, three sometimes. Genetic Genie is just a list of, of random SNPs. None of them, almost none of them are even um, validated by multiple studies. And it, it, it's really like, the gulf between what we have and what genetic genie has is is humongous. It's just like basically like it's so humongous. But in any case, I think that it, it's still useful for people to sometimes look at specific genes because they can sometimes enlighten you about a certain mechanism that might be happening in the body, right? But in terms of prediction, you want to look at what's called this polygenic risk scoring. And when we, we did internal studies, so there's external studies that you can look up and there's internal studies. The external studies show that uh, basically if you don't do polygenic risk scoring, it's basically like a coin flip in prediction. Basically you can't predict without polygenic risk scoring very well for vast majority of traits, complex traits. And we did internal studies. We wanted to see what does it look like if we, you know, just use a couple very significant SNPs and the same thing occurred. It's almost like a coin flip, right? It's maybe slightly better. But with the polygenic risk scoring, you start to get significant uh, results. 
And so if you look up these genome-wide studies getting variants for people, every gene, like in most of the time, every time they do one of these genome studies, different variants come up as significant. <laughs> it's not even the same variant. And the reason is because every, every study is using like slightly different methods and different approaches and they're, they're, they're getting information out, but it could be very, very tricky with what signal, what's noise when you're dealing with so much data. And, and so the bottom line that I'm trying to convey here is because genomics is so complex, people don't really understand what is legitimate, what's not. I think that's part of the reason why there's a hesitation about getting into it because people just like, I don't know enough about this. And, but that really creates a space where anybody can just, you know, input some SNPs and say, we're predicting, you know, input like a bunch of variants and say, oh, we, we can predict whatever we want, right? There's a specific company that doesn't even tell you what variants they're looking at, doesn't have any references. They basically just have a PDF of, you know, just words. And they're just telling you, they're predicting everything about you. Um, and when I like looked up, I, I spoke to the founder, I said, how many variants are you looking at in total? They said um, 83 in total. And I'm thinking, we look at 83 million variants in total, right? It, it's just like, how are you getting uh, one, a hundred, you know, a million and one conclusions from 83 variants? So the idea is, is that people don't understand what is going on. And, and, and I don't think the, this company even knew that they're not doing it legitimately. I told them, but, you know, I don't think they want to hear that. Uh, but in any case, um, you know, I, I mean, the, the, there is, they are doing something a little different. They're, they're doing like a hypothesis stuff where you know they're forming a hypothesis and sometimes it could be true sometimes it won't be right but they're they're really trying to form very broad conclusions around stuff that that doesn't have the evidence uh but in any case yeah I, i'm just saying that it is a very complex field the way that we're doing it self-decoded they don't have to be know what you know different things are in order to understand it right we're doing all the complex science in the back end we have a bunch of machine learning scientists and AI scientists and uh, genomic scientists, and, and they just can look at the results and, you know, and understand it. One cool thing that, um, that Tyler taught me how to do is you could search, like, say, vitamin D receptor, like you search VDR. And I did that last week, and I found um, basically what it says, alternative allele does that mean a mutation? That's kind of my current understanding. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's very complex. There's a lot of things to know. So we use that terminology simply because the science used it. So we didn't want to kind of reinvent the wheel. Uh, so there's what's called a reference allele and what's called an alternative allele. And this is basically just the stuff that they determined is the reference that alternative a little. <laughs> and I, I think it has to do with what was maybe the original allele a million years ago, whatever it is. But allele is just a, a, a you know a letter in your DNA. It's it's a you know it's it's one of the variants. So there's the reference and alternative allele, and really the only way to think of it, just don't think about the what it is it's just that we say here's the here's the reference allele here's the alternative allele here's what the alternative allele means and that's the only thing here's the population frequency and the population frequency allows you to see how common or rare it is in the population which mm. could be useful in certain ways right if 99 percent of people have a variant even if it's a risk variant it could be very significant by the way but it's still like, well, 99% of people have this. So I'm just like a normal person. <laughs> <laughs> so is there, a, so you're just saying it, there's not a hundred percent way to see, like makes like, make sure I have 13 VDR mutations. It's, it could be if I have the, no, so the, <laughs> the way that, the way that these, 
the way that these comp- the way that other companies are doing it, and we used to do this, but it's it, it's problematic from a scientific perspective, is they just look at the minor alleles. The minor is just the less common allele in the population. Now, there's a few problems with that. What population are you looking for? So one, you know, the African population could be different than the Asian population, and that's different than the European population. <laughs> so just saying something is a minor allele is a little tricky. Now. A lot of times you have something that's a minor allele in every population, but having a less common allele does not mean it's bad. It could be protective. So we don't want to flag something as negative, which, by the way, is what genetic genie does. They flag things that are less common in the population as negative, which is problematic. What we flag is if there's a study attached to a tri- you know, a, a certain the SNP or variant that it has shows that you're higher risk for something, and we show you what uh, variant that is 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 uh, connected to that risk. That's the way that you, you you should look at it, not in what's more or less common. Now, there is some value to looking at certain variants that are extremely uncommon, maybe like one, two percent, five percent of the population, and you, you might be able to build some hypotheses from that, but. You know, that that's pretty advanced stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed on some of the articles, I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head. Um, I think it was when you search vitamin D, you have like the individual um, uh, reading for my account, like built in. Um, like it would say your genetics show this, and then it has like a little mini article about that. Do you know what I'm talking about? I can't think of a good example. Yeah. So there's, there, <laughs> yeah, there, there's, a, okay. So basically you're, you, you, you search for something, let's say you search for vitamin D. So there's mm. many different things that you can, that you'll get from vitamin D. Number one is, and this is a new feature coming out. Yeah. So I'll let, I'll let you in on it a bit. Of, you can look at vitamin D and see all the things that it's good for and and how those and what your risk is for all those things. So you could see, mm. wow, I've got a high risk for certain things that vitamin D is helping me with. That's kind of how our personalized supplement works now. We look at where your risks are and then we take those supplements or either supplements that is good for those risks. And so, you know, we, we have that personalized supplement, but you'll be able to search for anything. So say, hey, I wonder how this supplement is going to be working for me. But, and you could just search for that and it'll tell you all the things that it's good for. We already have that capability, but it's kind of not as a feature. The, the feature is that we just give you a personalized supplement, but you'll be able to, and you can click on any of the things that uh, we show you and you could see what it's, what it's good for, but um, you could, you'll be able to search for it as well. But oh, in terms awesome. of, oh. Yeah. So anytime you come across a supplement or any lifestyle thing or whatever you want to know about, it's just going to, we already have that capability built into the reports, but it's not in a way that you could just search for it and, and it'll show you very clearly. But what you're talking about is when you search for, let's say vitamin D. So there's a bunch of things that come up. There's a report on vitamin D. So we're, we're typically looking at a polygenic risk score for whether you're predisposed to lower or higher vitamin D levels. There's personalized blog posts where you can see, like this is custom content that we've written for genes related to vitamin D. And you could read about that and see what your specific variants are. So it's kind of like reading a blog, but in this case it's personalized for you. Because you, you, know, you could see what your variants are. And so that's really cool. And then there's, you can look at certain genes, you can look at genes and SNPs that are connected to vitamin D. And so there's different, there's, you know, it gives you like a whole platform to really either do a deep dive or just look at things like that we give you directly from that we've already done the analysis on. And we, we have like faces to make it much more simple. So you could really take it from very simple to as deep as you want to go, really. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. I just went under DNA and the blog tab and I didn't know they're all listed there because I was trying to find these personalized articles just by searching. And uh, 
it's kind of difficult, yeah, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it says your personalized <laughs> snip table. And so, um, the other day I was dicking around with VDR, um, for longevity. And basically it says, I have one allele that's associated with longer lifespans in certain populations. That's pretty cool. Uh, and you multiple. could also click on the topic, which blog post you want to read about. So typically the way that I recommend to use self-decode and genetics in general is, and, you know, and biohacking in general. I, I don't know if this is how people do it, but this is how I do it. You focus on a goal. What do you want to improve? And one goal at a time. You don't want to do, I want to improve everything about myself <laughs> in, in the next week, right? You have one goal. Every month, I have one goal in mind. What do I want to improve? You know, our main goal and then maybe some uh, auxiliary goals, but they're kind of more in the back of my mind. I have one main goal and it could change every month, every few months, whatever it is. And once I optimize it to a level that I'm, I'm happy with, I go to the next goal and then I go to the next goal and then I go to the next one. You know, every, literally every month is a different goal. Right. And so, I mean, yeah. sometimes there's themes because I, I, I'll rotate my goals and you know, come back to a goal sometimes, but I always have one goal in mind. And so that's kind of how you want to use the site as well. What is your goal? Then look at that, go down that, you know, uh, rabbit hole or whatever it is, right? Go look, search up that goal and get the information that you need to, to help you optimize that goal. That's great. Yeah. It's a really focused approach. Otherwise you're just uh, spending a whole lot of time trying to do everything at once. <laughs> um, Correct. And, and how you track your progress. Uh, I'm a, a I, I look at a lot of debates in the health community and right now, one of the interesting ones to me is um, whether we should go 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 off lab tests or or our symptoms, and some people say lab tests are useless. Some people say symptoms are useless, and it's a really interesting discussion to me. And, uh, and some people say genetics are useless, <laughs> and, and some people say everything's useless. You should just breathe in air and don't eat. Right? It's just like the answer is that everything's useful. It's, it's the, your DNA is super useful. Your lifestyle, your, your symptoms is super useful and your lab tests are super useful. That's exactly why we've incorporated all those things in self decode. And, and that's why, I mean, it was a decision for me because I, I said, they're all really useful. They all have different strengths and weaknesses, right? Your DNA is really good because it's, it can tell you so much information. It's just like this massive encyclopedia about you. Right. And, and the negative to that is sometimes you can get lost or whatever. That's what I'm saying. Go to the part of the encyclopedia that is exactly where you want to focus on. Right. Don't start reading from A. Like, oh, okay. A, you know, Arch Archimedes. Like, no, go to exactly what you want to start reading about your body. Uh, and that, you know, for me, it's, it's, Again, different periods have been gut, mood, brain, cognitive enhancement, longevity, reducing cholesterol, whatever it is, just increasing creativity. I don't know, every, every couple months is a new goal, but whether you know, whatever it is. But in any case, um, so there's, um, yeah, I, I think you want to, uh, people should be focused and the DNA is really good at just giving you a bunch of information and it's telling you what your predispositions are, but I have predispositions for a bunch of different issues that either I'm not old enough to get or two, I've biohacked it, right? I've been able to counteract and reduce the risk for that, right? That's, and so there's a lot of things that maybe I'm high risk for like gut inflammation, and I see it on my genetics, but then I don't have gut inflammation now because I've been able to biohack that. Uh, and then there's a lot of other things that, you know, I mean, you have the same DNA, whether you're two or a hundred, but the risk of cardiovascular disease when you're hundred is going to be way higher than when you're two years old. 
<laughs> your risk at two is basically almost zero, <laughs> whereas your risk at a hundred is like, you know, eighty percent chance in the next year you're gonna die, right? Like, <laughs> so your your DNA is super useful, but you also have to understand that the you know the environment and your age and a whole bunch of other factors have uh, come to account. Then your biomarkers are also very useful in terms of tracking certain things, right? You could have, um, yeah, so I always, if, if you can track something, I always recommend tracking it. And then just looking at your symptoms is also super useful to, to also track, but also to, you, it, could, it could give you hints sometimes. Uh, you know, a lot of modern medicine is, is based on symptoms. It's like taking information from your symptoms. And also, uh, you know, based on your lifestyle, you can predict, if you're a higher or lower risk for a disease um, based on the lifestyle risk. So you have the genetic risk and your lifestyle risk, and you could also look at your biomarkers and that gives you a decent picture, I think. Mm. Yeah, I'm glad you, you said you have the same DNA when you're two as when you're 200, because we had a few people asking, <laughs> can you change your genetics? You know, I think epigenetics has uh, blown up. Um, you know, I think Bruce Lipton or a bunch of people have been talking about it for years. And uh, I think the only way, I mean, that's like advanced biohacking is like changing your genetics would be like with a CRISPR machine, right? Or they're looking into like tinkering with people's DNA. Either that or the vaccine. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, you're right. It's uh there's genetic, there's your genes and there's genetic expression. So the big argument with the vaccines is that mRNA vaccine is actually changing your genetic expression, but there's a lot of people thinking it's changing your actual genes. Uh, this is not the conversation to weigh in on that, but I, there's, there's your genes and then there's, there's your genetic expression. What we're doing is showing you what your genetic predispositions are, what your genes are, and we're showing you how to change that through genetic expression. So we are also, I mean, it goes hand in hand, right? If, if your genes were just fixed and, no, and, and, and you, you couldn't change that at, at what your genetic expression was, then no drug would ever work for you, no supplement, no lifestyle. Everything that you do is changing your genetic expression. I took um, thiamine and I was like, whoa, this is just a massive, like, this is exactly what I needed, right? And so ever since then, I've been making sure to get uh, extra thiamine. That's awesome. Um, hopefully we're still recording. I don't know why it went, <laughs> why I said recording again. Um, do you think there are any blood tests that aren't accurate? Because I'm really into... Uh, the fat soluble vitamins, you know, A, D, E, and K, I think those are really important. And I don't think A is, I don't think A is very accurate. Vitamin A. Okay. Test it. Yeah. I don't, vitamin D obviously is, is accurate. Um, vitamin K, I'm not sure, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause the argument I, that I've heard is like these are fat, they're, they're stored in the fat. You know, vitamin D is interesting because it's like in the fat cells, but it's not only in the liver, you know, or it's, I don't know, I guess they're all over, but you know, it's, it's kind of different with those because you can't look in the liver or look in the fat cells or. So vitamin K is an interesting one. I actually, if, when I look at my genetics, it says increased need, but I actually figured out before that, that I needed more vitamin K and so when I started eating like more animal foods, just either I got away from uh, more plant foods, I, I, I focused more on animal foods. I found that my gums were hurting. Like when I would floss. And I flossed every night and I, my, my gums would hurt. Like, what the hell is going on here? And I don't know. I don't know uh, how I figured it out. Maybe it was just through reading or whatever. 
I took, I, I just took vitamin K and it went away. And then I, mm. and then I just realized like, wait a second. Yeah. And, and then I, I stopped. And then every time my gum started to hurt when I floss, I just took vitamin K and it went away. And then, and so now I just take vitamin K every day and never hurts because, you know, I'm taking it. Um, so, I mean, you know, my gen- my genetics says that I have an increased need for vitamin K. So I guess that's what's going on here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, so th- th- there's, I don't know, there's different ways to know if you're deficient in something. Obviously, you could look at your symptoms, you could look at labs. Again, I had a different with thymine, I found that out through my lab, we have a genetic report now. But I, 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 you know, then vitamin K just through my symptoms. But, you know, a lot of things I could have just figured out from my genes. And that would have helped me out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. I think that's really important for vitamin D. Like I've been getting back into that lately. And um, I think the general recommendation is to like test every quarter when you're supplementing so that you know, like if you need to stop or if you need to up your dose either way. Mm-hmm. to go off your 25 OHD test. Yeah, I I don't really uh I don't really take vitamin D supplements. I just get sun. And I like I live in warm climates and Well, I have you heard sun. Have you heard Joe like the DHCR7 is basically the dehydrocholesterol you know big long word but basically it's a gene that works with uh, the sulfation of cholesterol to make D3 from sunlight. And Tyler got me onto this because basically he, he measured his 25 D in the middle of summer and he was low. And then he looked it up and he found that he had this mutation and I don't know, he's homozygous. I'm heterozygous. And we've been talking about whether, you know, it's his understanding that homozygous is more of a big deal usually um, than heterozygous, but that's one that I never even considered because I guess there's some people that can't make, I don't know if it's D3 at all or as much, maybe a combination from. It's probably as much, right? This it's as much. Everybody can make some D3, but there's all, all these kinds of things you have. I mean, everything is just like, you know, um, I, yeah, I'm sure there's, he's probably on something there. Right. I mean, we have a D3 report, so you could see. For me, I never had a problem. I, you know, mine says typical need. But, uh, it, you know, there's all kinds of genes related to that. And it could be the vitamin D receptor that maybe you're not, it's, it's not having as big of an impact, or it could be the creation of vitamin D. And I think that's, that's the way to do it is he developed a hypothesis. Uh, that's that's something you could do with genes too. By the way, you can develop hypotheses, but you want to check them. Uh, it's 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 not a bad thing to develop hypotheses. I'm not against that with genetics. I'm just saying it's very complex. A lot of times it can be wrong, but he he might be on something if he's got certain mutations there, and he's out in the sun a lot in the summer. And his vitamin D is not going up. And he's on to something. You know what I'm saying? I developed a, a hypothesis with uh, lectins. So we, and if you look up in, in self decode lectin sensitivity, you're going to see it's the only report that says hypothesis on it. <laughs> because, because I'm like, I, I just need this. It's like, the, you know, one of my main hypotheses in genetics, it, there's no direct studies on it, but I had a lot of clients that I looked up and anytime I thought they had a lot of food sensitivities, or lectin sensitivity, I uh, I found that they had these variants in the cannabinoid receptors. So I was like, we got to do this, and just but you know the team's like, there's no like good hardcore science on it. I was like, just put hypothesis in the title, <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we have. It's a hypothesis is in the title. I have it pulled up. There's like ten tip. Says I'm typical lectin sensitivity. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you might not be lectin sensitive. <laughs> typical means that uh, you're not you're 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 not lectin sensitive. Mm. I, I, I do you think you're lectin sensitive? I don't think so. I mean, I yeah, yeah I feel good on you know a lot of different foods. Um, yeah, the gluten one's interesting. I mean, uh, that seems to be a really individual thing. 
Yeah. And, and so what about the gluten one? Uh, what, what is your gluten uh, sensitivity show? I think it's typical. Let me, uh, let me pull it up. Oh, maybe I didn't generate it. I don't know. <laughs> oh, you got to generate. So yeah. I think I was typical. Yeah. Non-celiac. I'm we pretty sure I was typical. We, by the way, we don't oh, yeah, automatically. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm increased. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's why I, <laughs> like, I, I cannot eat gluten and I cannot eat lectins. It's just, it's, it's, wow. it floors me. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, what else is there? I mean, yeah, there's so much, there's so much information. That's what I'm saying is like, you do DNA tests, you can get all this information. It's crazy, right? It's just a, it's a no brainer. What, what is your BDNF levels like? Uh, I think I had, I think I'm, I'm pretty average. I'm like typical in almost everything. <laughs> Let me look it up, but I'm well, pretty sure. No, uh, you're definitely not typical in almost everything. Just, uh, <laughs> Refresh. Maybe you have to generate the reports. If you, when's the last time you generated them? I usually stay on top of it. Um, I think the other day there was like an error where they didn't generate or something. But uh, no, but there's new reports that we uh, put out. If we update a report or we, there's a new report, you got to generate. It takes like five ten minutes to generate. In okay. any old site, they would generate in like a split second because we weren't using a lot of data <laughs> and now it's like it, you don't understand it, it costs a lot of money to generate this stuff that's why we also don't do it automatically like the the the, the crap that that's out there it the the it costs like less than a, a fraction of a cent to generate everything that you'll, you'll ever generate because they use like a hundred snips <laughs> it's wow. like a joke yeah so so Joe, on the BDNF, I brought up the gene and it looks like I have two alternative alleles and then there's a bunch of articles, but I don't see anything else. Specific. No, no, there's, there's the, it, you probably have to just generate it. Uh, there's oh. a generate all button. Got it. Okay. No, you, there's also a search feature. You just type in BDNF. I could, uh, yeah. if you want me to share my screen quickly. I can do that. Oh, but. wellness report, right? It'd be under wellness report. Yeah. Yeah. It's the report. Oh, it's likely typical. Yeah. Okay. My BDNF <laughs> is, uh, is lower. And that's a big thing, by the way. If, if you have lower BDNF, there's, there's a lot of, it's very important. Brain derived so, nootropic factor, right? For people who haven't looked into it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a quick sprout for the brain. So if you're lower BDNF, you have to make sure you're getting enough exercise, light. Uh, there's also a lot of supplements that increase BDNF. Interesting. Yeah, my my sleep's been a, uh, you know, we all have issues. And I think people in the limelight, it, it's hard to talk about them sometimes, but I try to stay as transparent as I can <laughs> with people, my audience, right. quote unquote, or whatever. And um, my sleep used to be better in the last two or three years. I've had a lot of stress moves and stuff, but um tried to get my deep and my REM up with my aura ring. And I think I was just missing like movement and exercise. So I recently started like uh, the stationary bike with uh, oxygen exercise with oxygen, like breathing, like the big bag, like 93%. And I feel like it's improving my overall health. I feel incredible. Just like 30 minutes a day on that thing. It's pretty cool. Oh, exercise. I mean, I'm not sure exactly how much the, uh, I, I take some oxygen too. I don't know how that improves sleep, but exercise is, is one of the best things for sleep. There's no question about it. And part of that, by the way, is through BDNF. So if, especially if your BDNF levels are lower, it, it's even a bigger problem. Basically you want to increase BDNF in the daytime so that your body when you increase BDNF in the brain t- in the daytime, you sleep much better. Hmm. So it, it's kind of like that's the rhythm you want to get into. And the way to do that is through bright light, through exercise. And it's interesting because there's a whole bunch of ways that I know that my BDNF is low besides the genetics. It's like any supplement that's good for BDNF helps improve my mood. But here's the thing. If I exercise a lot, it helps replace sun for the mood benefits. Interesting enough. Like a lot of the, a lot of the mood benefits because they both are very good at increasing BDNF. 
And so, um, yeah, big, big, I mean, BDNF is, is, is something that I really learned from my genetics, actually. I wouldn't have known that, not from my genetics. Lectin sensitivity uh, was also, it, my genetics helped me figure out what was the pathway there. And I realized it was through the cannabinoid system. Uh, dopamine, what's your dopamine, your DRD2? You're Type in dopamine. To, put, putting me to work here. Let me see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious. Like, what you're doing Let me see. Yeah, a lot of the stuff I've been seeing is like typical uh, dopamine wellness reports. Let's see. Go to the uh, wellness typ report typical. section. Typical. Typical. Go to the health reports section. When you go to that, it automatically will sort by all the, the highest risk. Oh, I'm there. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I didn't know you could do that. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. I have higher lactate, blood calcium, testosterone. That's good. <laughs> uh, more likely anxiety, sinus congestion, <laughs> arachidonic acid, estradiol, higher, uh, higher arginine, higher cavities, more likely food allergies, <laughs> brain fog. It's, it's depressing <laughs> when you get to this section. <laughs> right, but you can also look at uh, the stuff that you have low risk for typical. Yeah. Uh, well, oh, one second rate. you're like, I'm typical and everything. And then you're like, whoa. <laughs> <What's going on? laughs> I was like, no way. It's not, not possible. Yeah. Well, I, I, I did a, um, I don't know if you've heard of like uh, Inside Tracker. I don't know how good that website is. For, I think I learned about it through Ben or some biohacker. I don't know. But I measured like 43 biomarkers last week. I just got it back yesterday. And my HSCRP hasn't, went down since my last one like five years ago it's like been at a 10 and i'm going down this rabbit hole last night and it's like associated with periodontitis and all sorts of stuff and like you know uh sudden cardiac arrest and all that stuff but i guess that's what is what was the number what it was, was the number? it was 10 yeah oh that is high <laughs> uh you you know you could upload lab tests to self decode as well Cool. Well, yeah, I think I might have mentioned it to you, but tomorrow around this time, I have uh, a little consult with one of your practitioners. I'm really excited to delve in for an hour and see what they have to say. Um, yeah, I didn't know that actually, but interesting. Yeah, because you're doing kind of like a limited release where you're taking on a certain amount of people, right, to do one on ones. Correct. Yourself to I'm going to, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to be doing that. Exactly. We, we are doing that. Yeah. I think I'm one of the first, so that's cool. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. No, it's, it's, we're doing exactly, we're doing limited release. I, I do think that genetics goes, it does go well with coaching just because there's a lot of information. So no matter how much you, how you slice it, it's just, there's people going to, they're going to, people are going to have questions, right? I mean, a lot of stuff you could understand yourself, right? But there's just, I mean, think about it, how much data you have in your DNA, right? And, and everything, it's just, it's your blueprint, everything about you. Yeah. And going back to labs for a second, Joe, like on your website, <clears throat> there's the tab shop labs and it's really cool. I think I, I might've started to order like home tests, um, which I didn't know existed, but are there labs you recommend that people that most people should get just to get an idea of what's going on or yeah uh there's a lot of labs um i i think i i can give you some of the labs that maybe i mean th there's kind of labs that i look for i think a lot of the standard labs are actually pretty good i wouldn't underestimate those then there's um uh Let's see what we got here. So, because like making the connection, my CRP is it could have possible connection to autoimmune disease. <laughs> so I noticed you have an autoimmunity lab for like seven hundred for members. So it might be worth doing. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what you. What, I I guess it it. Okay, so it comes back to focus. What are you trying to optimize right now? Right and. Every section, whether it's the genetics 
or labs or the lifestyle analyzer, you could pick a category and it'll show you, like for the labs, you could pick a category and it'll show you what labs are relevant for that category, right? I mean, maybe to, like, I don't know if, 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 if you, you want to be public, but what, what are you trying to optimize, right? I, that's, that's like the question that you have to ask or, right. And everybody, yeah. you're always trying to optimize. I mean, I'm always trying to optimize something and it, your, your listeners also have to have, you know, they have to be able to understand. So you ask what lab should somebody track? What are you trying to optimize? <laughs> right. It's like, you have to answer that question. If you try to do your health, kind of like well tell me everything i need to know on one foot it's not gonna work right well what what i'm kind of doing which seems like a little a bit of a focused approach is i got those 43 markers okay you know this uh inflammation marker hasn't budged in five six years so let's dive into that and i you know on the, on what you were just saying you could categorize immune function and inflammation and okay. Um, and I think one of these has, you know, HSCRP, but it also has all these other inflammatory markers in there, um, immunoglobulins panel and everything that goes with that. So I could like do a deep dive into that section, right? So is inflammation, so not, uh, sometimes you could, you know, sometimes you have a goal and then you want to look at the markers for that goal, but it seems like you're saying that you found a marker and now you want to make that your goal, right? right? But really, what is your goal though? Is that longevity? Is that? I'd say longevity, yeah. Okay, so that, okay, now we understand what your goal is. That's very important, right? I mean, I kind of understood from longevity because it didn't seem like you had any big problem and you were just like, well, I took some labs and this came out not optimal, so. That's what my focus is now. <laughs> that means that you, you're probably like longevity and anti-aging. That's your goal. And that's, that's a good goal. You know, sometimes I have that goal uh, every couple quarters. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's actually, um, it's been one of my most recent goals. So it's, 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 a note, it's a noteworthy goal, right? I probably had that goal in the past uh, 15 years, maybe like, 15 times or 10 times and and you know, then I go to something else but in terms of longevity okay so inflammation is important for sure you want to keep track of your hscrp and if it's above 1 then you got to get it down and genetics is actually I'll tell you so you want to look at this in many different ways right you want to look at, let's say, your genetics to see what might be causing your inflammation. Uh, we're going to be having a disease section, which can like look, you'll be able to look at autoimmune diseases. We have certain conditions right now, but basically, you want to see what, what is high risk that might be causing higher inflammation, right? I think this is probably a little more advanced. So this is kind of a topic that you might want a practitioner for, right? Because you have a general kind of inflammation. You really have to try to find what you could do it yourself, but it's just, it's, it's a little more advanced. So it could be related to certain nutrients. It could be related to a whole bunch of things, right? Maybe you might be deficient in nutrients. I would check your genetics to see what nutrients you might. There's a nutrient section there that you could filter diet and nutrition. And if you look at the DNA wellness reports, just click on diet and nutrition. But that's kind of just the basic thing. Because again, your, your goal is, anti, is longevity. So you want to see what nutrients are you more likely to be deficient in? Because that's a... That's related to longevity, right? Right. For me, yeah, diet nutri right. Go ahead. <laughs> for me, uh, zinc, vitamin K, folate, uh, those are, and then iodine are some of the things that come up as the fit, like I'm more predisposed to be deficient. And I have been deficient on all those things. Wow. I share your, uh, and riboflavin. I 
I have the iodine one too, increased need. Yeah. Um, folate, riboflavin. Riboflavin, I didn't know about until, I mean, folate, I also didn't know about until I checked my genes, but I've verified that through supplementing and I am deficient in folate. Um, even though my levels were high, it, because basically um, when I take methylfolate, like if I don't take methylfolate, my mood worsens. And so I, I, I'm pretty sure that um, what, whether you want to call it deficiency or whatever, if I take more of it, I feel better. Same with vitamin K, same with zinc. So those are three nutrients that come up. And then riboflavin, I need to experiment with more to see, you know, how that impacts. Like, I have to actually experiment with the Like, I take it, so I'm not worried about it, but I want to see what happens. I don't take it. If I take a lot of it, should do more experiments there. Yeah, I think B1 and B2, thiamine and riboflavin, are kind of overlooked. Like, a lot of people, I know in my vegan days, it was like B12, B12, you know, maybe B5 and B6, but, you know, one through one and two don't get a lot of uh, attention. And I think riboflavin is linked to like anxiety, you know, if, if you're deficient and then B1 is like blood sugar regulation, right? Like using glucose. B1, I mean, B1 has a huge amount of things. Uh, blood sugar, fat, mitochondria. It, it's really super important for the mitochondria. All the B vitamins are actually quite important for the mitochondria. And I mean, energy, it's, it's just, thiamine is quite, is, is super important. All the B vitamins are, are super important. I've mega dosed. I mega dose in every supplement that you could think of <laughs> just to see what the effect is. So I know exactly what every B vitamin does. I thought biotin was like a joke until I mega dosed on it. I was like, holy shit, this is a real, this is, this is not a joke. Like, I just thought it was one of those things that, oh, biotin, it's just for your hair and nails. Dude, that shit is legit. And then when I read up on it, I was like, it, it was, I felt like it was increasing my, my like, so I, I, why, I don't, I just took it because, and I, I just took it because I wanted to, I, I, I feel like I have to mega dose on everything. And, I just, and then I was reading up a bit more. I was like, holy shit, there's actually a lot of information of, of all the things that this could do. And one of the things I read is that it's the rate limiting factor for myelin. So if you take more of it, you're, you're going to increase your myelin. Now, I, anything that increases my myelin generally has good results for me. I don't, I don't know about, you know, so I, I just thought mm -hmm. like, okay, I, but that is really power. Like that was pretty powerful. It was too much. <laughs> it was too much <laughs> mileage for me. But I think I make sure I have small amounts of biotin now. We sound similar in the the megadosing category because I tend to do that, and I, you know, I, I'm leaning towards more going on blood tests from here on out. But I, you know, in the past, I've just gone off symptoms and how good I feel taking something, and if my body says enough, then I just stop it or lower my dose. Like I was with uh, cod liver oil earlier this year. I got onto it. My body was just asking for like 30 to 50,000 IU vitamin A a day. And on here, it says increased need for vitamin A, but also increased oh, need it does. for omega-3s, which is interesting. <laughs> right. That, that's very interesting. Uh, you got increased need. I have typical need for vitamin A and it's never, never helped me. Wow. I'm just like, I don't take it. It's useless for me. I, wow. Actually, it's even worse for me because when I take vitamin A, it competes with vitamin K2, and then my gums start to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What's interesting is like uh, for the last two years, I've been diving, like I told you before we started recording, into iron research and uh, iron overload, and then recently iron uh, deficiency anemia. And I think both could occur just depending on the person's genetics and if whether, you know, they're raised on cereal or so many factors, but 
um, a lot of the cases of anemia, you could partially correct with vitamin A supplementation. It's interesting. So there's like this really deep connection between like iron and vitamin A. And in my genetics, it says I'm like less likely to be anemic. But then on like 23andMe or other places, I've seen that I have, uh, was it hereditary hemochromatosis? Uh, which I think I searched on self decode and I didn't see that. The it's the something that we're going to be uh, releasing. It's just uh, cool. that we haven't done it because it's a medical report. It's like regulatory reasons we haven't done it. But, oh, wow. Uh, we're going to be releasing it. It's It might be one of those reports that we have to see exactly how we're going to be releasing it, but uh, we will be releasing it. That's good to know. Yeah, most excited about that one because uh, just trying to make the connections here with because a lot of your a lot of things do connect when you look at them. It's not just like, you know, islands of information. You could really connect some dots looking at them together. For sure. Um, so let's see, where can we so, go with? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, I, you asked me before. I don't want to go. I mean, we went on a tangent, but <laughs> you said, what kind of labs should you measure? And your goal was longevity, right? So some of the simplest stuff you should be measuring, blood pressure, fasting, blood glucose, heart rate variability, resting heart rate. Uh, you could measure your sleep, see how, how you're sleeping. And you can do that with an Apple Watch or, or an Aura Ring or whatever. Yeah, I'd say that's some... HRV, it, it, you've had experience with heart rate variability, right? Because that's, I guess I got to narrow my goals again, but my <laughs> HRV for the last couple of years has been horrible. Like I look at some of my friends and it's like 120, 130, mine's like right. 30, 40 all night. Oh, that's pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, no, no. My, mine, mine is, also, mine is uh, pretty high. I mean, it goes, mine is 120. To 130 on 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 good days on bad days on okay days it's uh over 100 on bad days and when i say bad days it's if i'm drinking alcohol <laughs> it's like 80, 80 85 the alcohol tanks it if you if your hrv is low stay away from any alcohol zero i stopped drinking yeah i was doing like a shot of tequila at night you know for a while as an experiment and then i just stopped and i feel a lot better even without you know yeah one shot's not sure. a lot but for some people it i is. feel like i have to stop drinking i i didn't i didn't drink until for the first like 32 years of my life and i i moved to uh uh tel aviv and uh i've just been i mean I've been working a lot, like over 60 hours a week here, but it's so easy to work hard and also party. So it's just, um, it's just so easy because like everything is like a five minute walk and it's like, oh, you just go here, come back. And so I, I've been drinking more, but I, I really should stop because it you, ruins my sleep. Have you tried biohacks to like cancel it out or counter that? Cause I have some friends that have done that in uh, <laughs> Southern California, like, you know, party, but like take handfuls of pills <laughs> beforehand to try to like, I do, I do balance it out. I do biohack it, but I, I you can definitely biohack it quite a lot. There's no question about it. It's just that, I don't like, I don't know. It's just, it's not good for you. Right. And I mean, yeah. Could you take a, can you take a poison and, 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 and you know, try to cancel it out? Yeah. But is that what you want to do? I mean, maybe, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I, think it, I thought it was like B, like the B vitamins is important. Yeah. Activated charcoal. Sometimes people do. And, of stuff. nice uh, well so there's uh, two main ones that i think are very important for that uh thymine and nac the rest of them i think are there, there's some other ones but 
those, those are the main ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, NAC was really popular with COVID. That was interesting. I've never taken it consistently. Yeah, I don't. I used to take it for years. I stopped and I started. Now I don't take it simply because I eat a lot of protein. <laughs> I don't have a problem with getting enough cysteine in my diet. And I just feel like I take a lot of supplements now because there's a lot of things I like to optimize. But I saw your story. It was like a handful. <laughs> yeah, I take a lot of supplements. So I got to be I got to be very stingy with whatever comes in there. It's got to be everything I, I have in there. I've got like 20 reasons why I take it. It can't just be like NAC, you know, whatever. I don't know. I, it, there's got to be a bunch of reasons. NAC didn't make the cut, fortunately. Yeah, on that topic, um, on on self decode, you could make a personalized supplement, and it'll like generate it. I think mine is like fifteen or twenty things with different dosages. It's kind of cool based on your mm-hmm. genetics. Yeah, correct. Yeah, and you could see why it's recommending each supplement. You can click on it, mm-hmm. see what your risks are. That's but awesome. But going back, do you want to go back to some of the labs? Yeah, yeah, we keep jumping around, but it's all interesting mm-hmm. stuff. But um, right, yeah. so I, I'll tell you what I'm trying. I, I gave you some key ones. I'll tell you some of the things that I'm trying to track and for longevity. Uh, my blood pressure is typically perfect. My HRV is very good. Like all the basic ones are pretty damn good. Now there's a few of them that are not, maybe not perfect. Or not ideal. LDL cholesterol is one of them. Now, there's a big debate about whether LDL has an impact. And again, it's it's. I know why my LDL is high. I just eat a lot of saturated fat from animal foods. That's it. It's, it's very simple. I, when I, it, it just goes up in in relation to that. So if I eat a lot of animal foods, my LDL goes up. And since I'm eating mostly animal foods, my LDL is going to be higher. It's no it's no mystery. Some people yeah, say that it's yeah. Sorry, mine's one sixteen. Sorry, it's last week. My LDL so. <laughs> one sixteen is not so bad. I don't think that's okay. a problem. Mine is like uh, mine ranges depending on how many how much saturated fat I'm eating. If I'm eating like ghee or coconut oil, holy shit, it goes to two hundred and ten. I'm not kidding. It literally goes to two ten. If I if I just eat like animal foods. It'll just be, it'll probably be like 170. If I eat more fiber, like a lot of vegetables, it goes down to like 145. And then now I'm doing a couple things that decrease it more. I want to see, uh, well, I, I'm, I don't know. I'm trying to get it down to at least 130. I don't think I'm going to, with my diet, I don't think I'm going to go below 100. Um, I've also... I've, not every supplement I want to take, though. For example, I, I, I put berberina in because that's one of the best things for LDL cholesterol. But I found that it's – and and I just started exercising. Uh, like before that, I was mainly doing push-ups. Well, before the push-ups, I only started the push-ups like two months ago. Before the push-ups, I was – not really exercising much. I would I would go on walks and then I'd play volleyball on the weekends. That was like my whole exercise. And uh, a couple months ago, more than two months ago, maybe like four months ago, I started doing push-ups. One, only one set, like one repetition a day. So, well, so I would do like, I don't know, I started at like at 40, 50. Now, then I got to 80, 90. Um, but I decided like, uh, basically a week or two ago that I want to, uh, there's a bunch of things that I wanted to do. So I want to lower my cholesterol. I want to increase creativity and extroversion. And I want to increase my testosterone. And what else did I want to do? Uh, and just be generally healthier. Right. So it's like the testosterone like free testosterone and total testosterone, those are two things that I wanted to work on. 
and my LDL cholesterol and, you know, like I said, creativity, extroversion, whatever. So I felt like, okay, I'm going to start working out. My body is, is, is pretty good without working out. Just doing pushups, my body uh, was pretty good. And it, when I look up muscle and self decode, it says that I have a higher predisposition for muscle mass, which I do. So I think a lot of that's most of it's genetic, and I think combined with a good diet, I think that's what uh, that's what contributes to that. But in any case, I I also so I started working out to do that, and I also started taking berberin also for the same goal anti-aging and uh also to reduce ldl cholesterol besides the ldl cholesterol it's a, it's a great anti-aging tool and <laughs> i'm like my muscles are hurting when i work <laughs> out i'm taking berberin and i was like let me see what the hell is going on here i researched berberin and ampk because it's an ampk stimulator AMPK actually prevent it is like an anti muscle building thing. Wow. And so I was like, oh shit, I gotta get rid of this berberin. <laughs> <laughs> so I get rid of berberin. And now and then I that that problem stopped. So now I need to te- check my cholesterol, uh, like what my numbers are when I'm working out. And uh, I uploaded a picture before I started working out, like just with the push ups. And people were like, holy shit. And so I'm, I'm going to be, I uploaded a story now, uh, you know, what, what it's like after a week. And I, I, but my goal isn't to be a, a, a workout junkie. It's just to work out one hour a week. I think with one hour a week, when you combine it with like, because I'm still going to be playing volleyball, I still go on walks. And so one hour, that one hour a week is going to be like 20 minutes, but in the gym but it's going to be like not like you know relaxing when when i'm in the gym just really using my time there and uh and doing that three times a week 20 minutes three times a week and i'm already feeling a big difference that's awesome yeah i see you posting your uh your shirtless (laughs) pictures on (laughs) social media and you look great it's working um yeah i recently my friend john inspired me to get into kettlebells so i bought a few of those at the local walmart because that's the only option i have way up here in the boonies <laughs> and where are starts, you i'm in northern idaho uh in like a pretty rural area so wow what 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 makes you be there like what's there <laughs> i just like the the fresh air and the quiet you know there's no light or sound pollution can't hear cars where i live from my house and uh, you can see all the stars, you know, if it's not a full moon. And uh, I'm, I have a lake and 20 acres and goats and chickens and bees. Holy and shit. Just the, the homesteading thing is kind of fun. And, you know. It's your place? Like yeah. those 20 acres? Yeah. Wow. You could start like a camp there or something. <laughs> that was the original camp Blackburn. Book. It's got that a ring the- to it. <laughs> that, I mean, I, I hosted some underground retreats to just like four you know, people or a couple people in the past, but it's just a lot of work. And I just, you know, I, uh, I don't think I'll end up going that route, but I do have my own, you know, float tank, hard hyperbaric chamber. It's like, I like all it. The, <laughs> all if, I, cool if I need some fresh air, I know where to go. <laughs> Come on up. Yeah. That'd be great. And, um, I know back to labs is hilarious because we keep cir- <laughs> circling around. Yeah, back to labs. So what I <laughs> what I'm checking out is uh homocysteine. I have a tendency to higher levels if I don't take B vitamins, mainly B6, B12, B9. Interesting. Huh. So I, I, I have my eye on that. It's so what you're checking is gonna be what you need to like if you check homocysteine five, ten times and it's optimal. You don't need to check homocysteine, right? What what about this, Joe? Like, say you're a weirdo like us, and you're into biohacking and optimization. Um, and I know you say you know stick with one goal, but what if I want to just go crazy on labs? Like, could I just get different panels every month, just to kind of see if anything's out of range? Or you can. I so I don't think that's a in con 
that, that that's contrary to the goal. So if your goal is longevity, I, I think, first of all, you want to do a bunch of labs and see what's out of the optimal range. And then you could start tracking those labs and seeing what you're doing, how can you get it into that optimal range? Not every lab, uh, like I'll give you an example. So my T3 was not good when I wasn't very healthy. I got that into the optimal range uh, because one of the things that decreases T3 is inflammation and oxidative stress. So when my inflammation and oxidative stress went down, my T3 went up. And it's just been interesting because I saw like a slow and steady trend increasing my T3 and the better I felt, the, the more my T3 was. Now, I've also taken T3, of course, and yeah. you know, it didn't just fix all my problems when I took it, but um, I have a bunch of sign- see what it was like. I have a bunch of Sinomel here that I bought on Mexican drugstore website. <laughs> <laughs> yeah welcome to my world <laughs> <laughs> i probably have low t3 then if i have that inflammatory marker it's it's going to be a really interesting uh journey to find out what's going on there so you definitely have to track your hscrp that's a longevity marker and mm-hmm. if you have a level of 10 it's obviously not from air pollution I'll tell you that much but <laughs> it's it's from other stuff and you gotta you should that's for you i think that Checking, I mean, you, you want to check a bunch of stuff like testosterone, how is your HbA1c, how's your vitamin D, B12, folate, ferritin, white blood cells. Yeah, I got a, a lot. I got most of that tested last week and my testosterone, I was bummed. So in 2016, my testosterone was uh, almost 1300. <laughs> and oh, wow, uh, what did you do? I was just eating a lot of oysters and, and, you know, ground beef and, and now it's seven thirty-three, wow. which is still pretty good, but went down a yeah, little bit. Yeah. I mean, it's still nothing to worry about, but 1300, I mean, that's high. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't on TRT. I'll tell you that. <laughs> you know what it is? You're not getting sun. The sun breaks down testosterone. Interesting. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah. Wow. At that time I was nude sunbathing a lot in a cold stock tank, cold tub. So I don't know. Oh, wait, was this the summer? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was doing the whole Jack Cruz quantum health thing. So like, you know, ground at noonday sun at 55 wait a second, degrees. It was 1300 when, when you, it was in the summer or in the. It was in this, uh, this was uh September when I tested. So that was 1300 or 700? 1300. Okay. Yeah. And no, I is, mean, yeah. 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 It's interesting, so, but um, yeah. And, and this last test was around the same time, you know, August. So just a month before. But um, mm, yeah. So it wasn't the timing. Yeah. But my sex hormone binding globulin is 52, this last test. And so uh, I'm going to get back on the nettle route and, uh, I think boron's good to lower that, right? There's a lot of things. Yeah, boron, uh, I take boron to increase testosterone. You should upload your results into the the uh, selfie code. I did. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I might do a whole solo show on my podcast after I do that consult with uh with the doc. Okay. It should be Sounds should good. be fun. Yeah, but uh so yeah, Joe, we have a lot of questions. Um do you want to jump into some of those? Uh, Let's do it. There's quite a few. Let's do it. Um, and my girlfriend actually asked a lot of good ones here. Um, let's see. Prevalence of vitamin D mutations. So earlier you were saying you could look up the prevalence. And is that what you would recommend to look at that? Like if you want to see the prevalence of VDR mutations, it will say that? Or It's an, it's an advanced feature. It depends how advanced you are. I think that's one of the things with genetics is that you could – there is a role for people who are not that advanced. You just look at the end results. But if you're, anyone's looking at SNPs and developing hypotheses from it, that is an advanced feature. I do that myself. And, uh, you know, Dr. Panzer is doing it. And you're doing it now. <laughs> so I think it's cool. I'm all for it. But it is an advanced feature. Okay, cool. Yeah, because... 
the whole vitamin D thing. So, so he, such a heated debate, um, that I've been in the last few years and this whole genetics piece just totally changes the conversation of vitamin D supplementation and supplementation with everything. I mean, as the, as the owner of a supplement company, um, that individual aspect to it is, uh, is really interesting to me. Um, cause then you're not just throwing the whole kitchen sink at somebody, you know, and saying, you know, yeah. All- <laughs> and a hundred percent. And, and, I think, again, we're there, we're here to give information, right? And, you know, you could, like, we actually, we don't care about, like, you know, we're here for the information. And I I think that, like you said, I think you hit it on the nail. uh, They had the, the, like, exactly right that all these arguments for the past 50 years, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like diet this nutrient that nutrient this thing that thing like every I, I keep on seeing them different people have different tendencies right and you know i mean how many times have you seen some supplement working for one person and not another person I mean, i'm a big fan of supplements but the fact is is that sometimes they don't work for you know one the same supplement doesn't work for every person every person is different right same drug doesn't work for every person. Same, you know, there's certain things that are, are going to be good for everybody, right? Exercise, sun, uh, like in, in, in at least some dosage, right? It's not healthy if you're just sitting all day, right? <laughs> I think we can agree on the stuff that everybody agrees on. You don't have to look at your genetics. That's the rule of thumb, right? If everybody says that at least 15 minutes of sun is good in the day, or, or it's healthy to be outside, you don't need to look at your genetics. Now, you can look at it for, like, is it better to be out for longer or less, right? Uh, but you same with exercise. Some people are going to be like, you should exercise 10 hours a week. <laughs> <laughs> Some people are going to be like, no, 10 minutes a week. But everybody says exercise is important. I, I, I think, you know, if you have a... When I wasn't as healthy, exercising too much was a problem. Like, I, I, you know, people with chronic fatigue syndrome, things like that. But, um, yeah, I mean, uh, also exercise is, 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 a, is a bit hard on my gut. So if I don't take mm-hmm. care of my gut, it's, it's, it's a problem. But now it's not a problem because I know all the strategies, right? So the idea is, is that, you know, um, you got to really look at what is individual for you. Yeah. Yeah. I was definitely under exercise, even though I was like moving a lot and taking care of animals, like the, even the rigorous cardio, just a few weeks of that. It's like, feel incredible. It's awesome. So when I'm snowed in here in the winter, that's going to be a, a game changer to uh, do hard cardio <laughs> indoors. <laughs> right. For um, sure. But I, you have a supplement company, right? Get Joe, you have a couple products. Yeah. So look, I mean, <laughs> my, my philosophy is personalization, but you know, we, we have a personalized supplement. I think it's a little expensive to be honest. Um, I mean, it's, it's a little, it, it is cool. You could pick whatever supplements you want and look at what it's good for. You could delete like any ingredient. So it's, it's very dynamic. I like it. And that's cool. It's one way, but I also like, I built a formula that I just happen to do very well with based on my genetics. And some people are just always going to be like, Joe, tell me what works for you. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, here's what works for me. Right. <laughs> Here it is. I, I have it in the package. Here you go. And I just think that, you know, that, that's, that's how some people want to operate. It's just what it is. So I, I, I've got, that's like a, so I have Joe's mood formula, right? I don't, I don't care if anyone buys it or not. Uh, it's, it's, it's just what it's, it's something that works for me. It's like basically, a, it's also a general formula that I built because like, okay, here's some of the things that I think are, there's a lot of people that are just not going to do a genetic test. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I think my mom is, is one of those people. They, they, for whatever reason, they're just like, uh, I don't know, whatever. I think it's everybody should, of course, but 
I just wanted like a formula that I could just like give to people, friends or whatever, right? If they're, they're having a mood issue. So that's kind of, I only have two supplements. One is the mood thing. And the other one is just a, an ingredient that I, it was my favorite supplement, but I couldn't get it anywhere. So I had to just create it. <laughs> it's uh, Joe's Resistant Starch, where uh, it's just, it's a resistant starch that's not filled with lectins like the potato starch crap that, that they sell or the green banana stuff. And that's like my number one supplement for, I mean, butyrate. I, how much do you know about butyrate? Is that something you know about a lot? I used to look into it a little bit, but um, not too, not too much. Um, All right. The fatty butyrate acid is group? like, yeah, exactly. You know something about it. Yeah. But <laughs> butyrate is like the number one thing I think is like, it, it's incredible. And it's just something that there's so much information about, but the more you read about butyrate, the more you'll see that how incredible it is. Now, I've tried to take butyrate pills, and it's disgusting. It's literally disgusting. You're gonna you, you you're gonna throw up if you take butyrate pills. <laughs> and I've I've so it, it was funny. This there was this new study that came out, and I saw it in Science Daily or whatever. Uh, it came out in Frontiers, I think, the journal or one of the, I don't know. It came out in some journal, but uh, it was basically saying like. You know, the, the title was like this targeting the microbiome fixes food allergies and sensitivities, whatever. I was like, what the hell? You know, I, I have a lot of food sensitivities. I'm like, what is this thing? Right. So I look at the article and, they, you know, they're talking it and I see butyrate. I'm like, shit, this is the, this is the thing that makes the biggest impact on my food sensitivities. Right. And then they're saying that, you know, butyrate is traditionally very hard to take because it tastes like shit and you get nauseous from it right in, in different words they use and and i was like yeah 100 percent, i agree so they have this formula that it doesn't taste bad right that that's what they have this you know this new formula they're going to try to take it through fda trials whatever it is i'm like thinking what are, what do you need this formula when butyrate is when you take resistant starch your your gut already has a butyrate factory in there all you need is resistant starch that's it and it makes your butyrate factory like it, you'll you can create as much butyrate as you want from that resistant starch oh. and what i did is i i i've taken pills and try to you know see what how does that relate to like the powder I literally had to take like 18 pills to get, <laughs> to get like an equivalent of like 40 grams, 40 grams of the powder is, is, is just the starch. You can eat it. You can take it in one shape, nothing. And I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm taking, and, and I was like getting like about to throw off from all these pills. I've, I've literally, I've taken thousands of pills though. Cause I wanted the butyrate. But then I just stopped and I said, screw this. I'm just going to, you know, this resistance starts way better without the nausea. And he's um, creating the butyrate in your, your colon. And that gets through to the bloodstream. It, cr it crosses the brain barrier. So you get all the butyrate you need and way more. Like you really, you got this butyrate factory in your colon. Um, whereas if you're, yeah, there's no need to swallow it. So I, I think... Uh, butyrate is like the number one thing. The only way to really get it into your system at quantities that have a big impact is through uh, without getting super nauseous um, and without spending a ton of money because the butyrate supplements are also very expensive is through the resistant starch. So that's, that's the only other supplement I have. That's awesome. Um, is, isn't there like a MCT oil connection to butyrate? Or am I thinking of something else? uh not really no so medium chain triglycerides i thought i thought that increased in butyrate production or something but maybe i'm mixing up something i read <laughs> i don't think so no it's it's it, it increased ketones mm. mm -hmm. but i mean the ketones and butyrate are actually quite similar so mm. meaning like they have very similar uh health benefits mm. 
So like any benefit that you think about ketosis. Now, the thing is, is in order to get into ketosis in a big way and get a, like deep into ketosis where you're getting a ton of ketones, you need to like never eat any carbs, <laughs> which is not the healthiest thing. Uh, and even you got to be low on pro, like you got to do a crazy diet of like 80% fat, <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> and it's just too crazy. But even then you're not getting the same level of ketones as you are, as you are butyrate. Like you can really ramp up butyrate and have like a massive butyrate factory. Whereas the ketones, if you get into ketosis, there's a limit. So you're never going to get hypoglycemic. It's the same impact. So these things, these molecules feed the brain. And they're a backup energy source. So if you take MCT oil and you got these ketones, I've taken a ton of MCT oil. I like ketones. I like butyrate. I've taken a ton of MCT oil. It causes my stools to become bloody. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you have that predisposition for gut inflammation, so like it just like triggers Crohn's disease in me or something. I don't know what the hell's going on, but it, it like if I especially if I like. Brain off the, the uh, octane oil, yeah. the C8. Um, oh, oh, it's terrible, right? <laughs> and then it also it's nausea and and bloody stools. So uh, I stopped taking that stuff. <laughs> and yeah, my cholesterol goes up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think it was my first or second bulletproof conference. I don't go to them anymore. But years ago, they, I was drinking like that fat water. I think it had like MCT <laughs> in it. <laughs> and I was like combining that with like keto prime. And I was just popping things like candy walking around, unfair advantage, whatever. And I was like, felt like I was on crack. It's like, all right, this is not a good feeling. And my stomach's feeling weird. <laughs> 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 <And it's> like... <laughs> you get diarrhea. Seriously, you get diarrhea. Um, I, I got diarrhea, blood stools, and nausea. And uh, and then I just felt a little weird. Like it, it increased my body temperature too much. I was just like, what's going on here? I, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> but um, butyrate has all the same benefits without any of those uh, negative effects. Mm. So, awesome. you know, it's a backup energy source. You, you won't get hypoglycemic if you're taking, if you get that butyrate, that uh, resistant starch. Awesome. Um. Yeah, I'll put a link below so people can check check that out. Um, so another iron question. I don't know if you looked into this, but is there genetic causes for anemia like there is for iron overload? So I guess like, oh yeah, is there the reverse sure. of hereditary hemochromatosis? <laughs> Everything that you can think of, pretty much. If some people have it in the population, and some people don't. It's genetic, hmm. right? I mean. It, almost everything is genetic to some degree or another. It's just uh, the question is what degree and, you know, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely there's uh, predispositions for lower iron. We have a report on that too. You can mm. click on iron. Oh, I didn't see that lower iron. Cause that's, that's well, just type iron area of interest. It'll, iron. Yeah. If you type iron, it'll say if you have a typical need or a higher need. Oh, okay. Yeah, mine's typical. Mine's also typical. Interesting. Nice. Um, so the, one of the most common questions, I think this was the number one asked question, uh, is our genetic information safely stored? So people hear, you know, artificial intelligence and freak out. And, and I think, you know, they're concerned that they're going to have a clone made of them and my personal belief is they already have all of our information and, you know, there's nothing really we can hide, but maybe some people are like, why make it easy? I don't know. What are your, what are your thoughts on all that? Well, we're, we're very careful about that stuff. So we, um, that's one of the things you need to be careful about though, in the sense that if, if you want your information to be secure. So a lot of these pop-up companies, these small companies, um, they don't do any security stuff. And, and mm. we know it's very easy to see if they're doing it. Um, we have a business to business thing where we allow other companies to license our technologies. 
So not only do we have a duty to the consumer, we also have to worry about the other companies. So we take a lot of security steps. We, we've had a lot of, we've had a, some companies do penetration tests and security audits of our stuff, like some very uh, anal companies and we pass, right? Like it's, it's not a, it's not a simple thing. Um, but so that, that's security is very important. Privacy we um, are HIPAA and GDPR compliant. The, the other companies are not HIPAA and GDPR compliant, tell you that much. Mm. Um, but also we don't sell the data. I mean, some companies have that as a business model, like 23andMe. And then other companies uh, don't necessarily have it as a business model, but they sell, they send the, the data goes to China. They don't tell you that. But uh, it's kind of like you buy, a, you know, you buy some, a phone, where does it come from? China. <laughs> you buy whatever. Genetics is also cheaper to do in China. So a lot of companies do it in China, but they don't tell you that, of course, because you'll never send your data to China. But ours uh, is in the United States or, or Europe. So we don't send any data to China. But um, so that's kind of some of the big problems is either sending the data to China, um, not having good security. Uh, or or privacy, and um, or as a business model selling the data, but I, I think people need to understand that. Yeah, even selling selling the data is not a big thing if you're not a huge company because very few nobody really gives a shit about uh, even like it wouldn't even be a, a, a business model if we wanted it to be, which we don't, but. Uh, just because you need like, I don't know, a million people just to even start getting like into that territory. Because again, 23andMe is already selling it. So they already, <laughs> they got a market, they got 13, 15 million files. Um, you know, it's like what you're, if, if they, they need to sell to somebody, you're going to go to 23andMe, right? What, what are they like? We have a uh, hundred thousand customers, which is what we have. It's not. It's not even like something that we we, we think about. But again, we in our terms of service, we, we don't do that. We we say that we don't do that. So we we we're not allowed to do that. Mm. And and I'm I'm against it as well. I don't think that should be the business model. I, you know, I think giving people good information and you know making sure we're profitable is. Uh, without selling data is, is the main thing. Yeah, one of the more interesting um, points I made, uh, I've heard about this is, you know, that they could uh, people could potentially create a bioweapon that's tailored to people's genetics, but I kind of feel like they've already done that, right? <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I think that is possible in the future. I don't, I don't think that they have that now. But it is possible in the future, I think, because they they need to do a study on that. I don't think they've done a study on, you know, who's more sensitive to Novichok or <laughs> Sarin Gas. Um, but if you technically, just like you could see if you're, you know, more likely to be deficient in vitamin A, you could see if you're more, you know, which chemical agent you're more sensitive to. Now, I don't know if that's a problem unless you're Kim Jong-un's brother, right? <laughs> so yeah, if you're Kim Jong-un's brother, don't get any genetic tests, right? Uh, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, yeah, the whole, the, the AI aspect to it's interesting to me because I had been, you know, watching like transhumanism documentaries I actually went to one of the rallies with uh it, what's his name he has a crazy name zoltov or something like that uh i think he ran for president in the transhumanism party Zol 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 zoltan yeah i had pizza with uh after like a transhumanism rally just like this would be an interesting you know conversation it was just a small group of like eight of us and uh he's an interesting guy they were all about 
you know, extreme biohacking to where, you know, bionic organs it was an interesting conversation I was having with them, that they were all everyone I was eating with, they were like, yeah, I would switch out my, you know, my heart to just have it never stop. <laughs> and like... Yeah, I think that's a little, that's too extreme for my <laughs> for my taste. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, what I don't think the technologies are there that justify the risk, right? If if it were the case, then I'd say yeah. But I think that you know the the soft stuff, the biohacking, changing some gene expression with some good lifestyle supplements, diet. That's where I'm at. Yeah, yeah. Once you start switching parts out and implanting stuff, the Neuralink thing is really interesting. I can't tell if that's real or just a big marketing thing. <laughs> It's a big marketing hype. How many times have you seen him say that uh, self-driving is out in two weeks? <laughs> it's here. It's here. Just we need a software rewrite. It's just no, no. It's here. I'm a hundred percent certain. A hundred, hundred percent. It's here. Then they have a filing that it's like level two autonomy. It's like. Yeah, I was watching a video of Elon last week, and he's like, I think he was talking to Joe Rogan. He's like, yeah, we just take out a piece of the skull and then just re replace it, and these wires go very carefully into your brain. Just like, is that really possible? <laughs> I don't trust anything that Elon says in terms of, <laughs> like, what's, what's po like, the timelines or anything. I don't know. It's like, He's he's always like way too optimistic. I, I think it 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 could be possible, but I don't they don't I don't think we're very close to that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um let's see. Someone asked top things you could do to support MTHFR mutations. That's the first one I heard about. And then I think ComTA I learned about from Tyler and then get into all the other ones. But I think I think people are a little too focused on the MTHFR, to be honest. I do have that variant, by the way. And um, so, but I think people are a little too focused on it, right? Especially if they have like one variant. I have the, two of the variants. What do, uh, what do I do for it? I just take a uh, methylfolate. End of story. It's not rocket science. It's just, there. there's like, there's other information on it, but it's a lot of hypothesis stuff, like uh, riboflavin. I mean, riboflavin has some good information. I would say just uh, so there's two different things with MTHFR, right? One is that as long as your homocysteine is not high, there hasn't been any studies that showed that it's negative. So everything and uh, beyond the if you have low if you have you know good range of homocysteine is hypothesis based now some of that could be correct some some of it could be wrong um the only two things that you know really have some kind of evidence are uh riboflavin and, and uh, methylfolate and i take those two things some people have said other things again the other stuff is more hypothesis driven and could be interesting to read about but I think, you know, methylfolate is is uh, good enough. Mm. Awesome. Um, getting back to controversial territory, I saw recently you posted some interesting stuff about seed oils. <laughs> and, uh, I know the last couple of years, I think in the last like year especially, there's been um, just a a, a huge. Uh, campaign against seed oils and i think you pointed out that the fatty acid uh composition of canola oil is actually better or the same as olive oil which is interesting it's it's very similar actually <laughs> it's something no that it's a fact you can look it up anyone can look it up because people are so the, the, it's a complex topic but People are ragging on like canola oil. Like I always thought canola oil was the worst thing, and then I looked. I you know I looked it up. I was like, what the canola oil is probably like ninety percent 
lino, linoleic acid based on like what everyone else thinks. I'm like, what? No, this can't be right. It's like uh, 50% oleic acid, which is, is not too different from olive oil or it's 60% or something. It was, uh, let me see exactly what uh, percentage that is. Canola oil. Yeah, no, lake acid, acid is found in olives, largely. Yeah, and avocado. So it's about mm. 60% oleic acid. <laughs> Seriously. And then 10% is ALA, and that's like a healthy one. That's what's found in flax and chia seeds. It's the omega-3. So 10% of is omega-3. 60% is oleic acid, which is found in the uh, avocado oil and, and uh, olive oil. So the actual, actually the uh, percentage of fatty acids is not very different from it w with canola oil. So I, I, I was just always like, I don't understand. I, I mean, okay, here, here's a trick question. Grapeseed oil. And again, I didn't know this before. So grapeseed oil, would you say it's better or worse than canola oil? Better. Better. Why? Because you heard so much bad stuff about canola oil. Grapeseed oil is the worst one. <laughs> <laughs> By far. Not even close. It's like, great. okay, sunflower oil or canola oil? Sunflower. Yeah. Is better or worse? Better. Better. Sunflower oil is the second worst one. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> yeah. It's like you look, I remember like looking at the ingredients, sunflower oil, okay, this is not too bad. Grapeseed oil. They don't, they, 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 they don't want to say canola oil because it got so much bad press. But actually those are much worse, grapeseed and sunflower. Wow. I have a bunch of, um, you've probably seen this, kava tinctures and these companies are using sunflower oil as the base. It's interesting. Right, because they, they would never use canola oil because of how much bad press it got. But it's just bullshit. It's, it's it, canola oil. I would take canola oil any day of the week over grapeseed oil or sunflower oil, right? Wow. I mean, it's just facts. You look at the facts. What, what are the facts? The facts are that canola oil is 60% uh, oleic acid, and oleic acid is uh, better than the uh, linoleic acid which is found in grapeseed. And also I looked at the studies showing how easy it was to oxidize and uh, grapeseed oil and um, sunflower oil are, are oxidized easier than the canola oil because, uh, because canola oil has higher levels of oleic acid. Wow. Yeah, the oxidation of fatty acids is a really interesting rabbit hole because they each have different temperatures right at which they oxidize but a lot of them are like over 200 degrees fahrenheit right yeah there's different temperatures there's a bunch of different factors but olive oil is better than canola oil it is healthier there's no question about that especially the extra virgin olive oil but it was just interesting to see that the fatty acids are actually very similar <laughs> between olive oil and canola oil <laughs> it's like <laughs> There's some misconceptions I think about canola oil, but I, I think it's it's way overblown, right? Now again, I think if you olive oil is going to be much healthier, and I I would choose olive oil, but I think uh, canola oil was overblown. I don't. It's hard to know, so I'll tell you the thing with vegetable oils. When you look at the research, you don't come to a conclusion that vegetable oils are that bad. Any of them, really, right? Uh, but I, I spoke to Mercola. He was telling me some stuff. A lot of it, it's, it's hypothesis stuff and it could be right. It could not be. We don't know. It's just like hypothesis, right? So the, the, the all these articles that I read saying that it, you know, how bad it was would start talking about a hypo, like you could see when somebody's already talking about hypothesis. They're just like, the whole evidence was here's a graph of, disease <laughs> here's a graph of vegetable oil consumption <laughs> and it's going up but what they don't like basically vegetable oil consumption is also you could use the same graph with anything here's um air pollution or something air pollution right 
carbon dioxide, <laughs> uh, the num the amount of uh, methane <laughs> I, like, from cows. I mean, you know, heavy metals in the environment. You know, what the hell is going on? Probably a little bit of everything. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like yeah, because I, I I sell vitamin E, Joe, and like for the last two years, two and a half, whatever. And one of the things I've been educating people on is like there's that vitamin E and PUFA relationship. And that seems pretty well established in the literature where your requirement for vitamin E goes up with the amount of omega threes you consume um, or, right. you know, omega threes and omega sixes. And so if someone is consuming a lot of omega threes, I, I think it's smart to supplement vitamin E. They're going to do that. Correct. So part of the argument is that these, these vegetables stay into your, in your lipids for years and they can oxidize there as well. And, you know, taking more antioxidants could theoretically help that. But I mean, what we do know is I think what everybody agrees on is eating a ton of packaged foods is not a good idea. <laughs> I don't know anyone who's like, no, packaged foods packed with sugar and vegetable oils is a great idea <laughs> very healthy <laughs> if you're eating like if you're eating donuts entman's donuts not a good idea i don't think anyone's going to tell you that that's healthy um and just too much packaged foods with too much crap or whatever it is oh, vegetables staying you know staying staying in shells for who knows how long and you know then from the shell, like it's just they also cook it with with high heat. It, it's not a good idea, right? I'm I'm not saying it's healthy. I think it's probably overblown still, and I think there's some misconceptions there. Like you would like read about grapeseed oil and be like, oh, it's probably better than canola oil. <laughs> it's like no, it's not. Well, you, so that, I just I just looked up the smoke point of canola oil. It's 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Says good, you know, Doctor Google, good for high heat purposes like deep frying. I no, was raised on donuts, another, you know. It was, was that's another. <laughs> it was that morning cartoons well. and donuts. <laughs> really? Yeah, the smoke point has nothing to do with how easy it oxidizes. So they've done studies on how easy it oxidizes. A lot, like a lot of. There's a couple factors with the oxidation. It's the uh, fatty acid profile, but it's also how many antioxidants it has. So canola oil doesn't have a lot of antioxidants, whereas olive oil does, especially extra virgin olive oil. So that's kind of where the big advantage is. It has like healthy polyphenols, right? But technically, theoretically, if you add in like a bunch of antioxidants to canola oil or you cold press it and add in antioxidants, then... It's just cold pressed canola oil is not very common, and yeah, yeah. Because I thought canola has some vitamin E in it, right? A lot of them do. Yeah, a lot of the oils have vitamin E, uh, just because it's fat soluble, and these oils are concentrations. But I think that you know, if you cold press it, canola oil, and you would add in as much antioxidants or polyphenols that olive oil has, canola oil would be just as healthy as olive oil. Now those are Big caveats, but <laughs> sounds like a new uh, potential uh, health brand. Someone could make right, <laughs> exactly. A, a trigger everyone. Yeah, I know there are a lot of carnivores right now that are, you know, hinging their entire marketing thing around seed oils are going to kill you immediately, and you know, eat all saturated fats. And I think it's an individual thing, right? With with the fatty acids that someone consumes based on their genetics and. A lot of factors. Yeah, I also think it has to do with... Uh, so I personally think, and I think it's extremely clear that LDL cholesterol contributes to heart disease or cardiovascular disease, right? Now, um, I think the oxidized LDL is more important and there's a lot of other factors that, that are quite important. So... When I look at my risk, it's not high given that I do a lot of things, right? You know, my blood pressure, my blood glucose, my HRV. There's a lot of stuff that's related to heart disease. And the only risk factor I have is LDL. 
right? Max dyes, LDL is good. Uh, the main one I have are the lipids. And that's pretty much from the saturated fat. There's some genetic predisposition, for sure, but it's also the saturated fat. So for me, I don't think saturated fat is very healthy. For that reason, number one, let's, let's look at saturated fat, okay? Uh, number one is we can look at my, we can look at my biomarkers. My LDL shoots up to the roof, right? Number two is how I feel. I was so, I bought into the whole saturated fat thing and I was like, okay, everybody's saying coconut oil is a superfood. So I literally took coconut oil. I, I, I took like eight tablespoons of coconut oil. I'm like, this is, this is the best thing ever. I've never been, so, I was never so sick in my life. And like brain inflammation, everything that you read about on these animal studies about what happens when you feed them high fat diets, I had all that. Gut problems, brain inflammation. Like it, it, I was winded after like, you know, 10 minutes of walking. <laughs> it was just the worst thing ever for me. And then I was like, okay, like, let me try four tablespoons a day. I, I felt better, but still not very obvious. One, the optimal level is zero tablespoons of coconut oil, it turns out, right? <laughs> for some reason, ghee was better for me, but even then, not optimal. I, I don't know what else, like, so based on my experiments, based on my biomarkers, not very optimal for me. And um, what did my genetics say? Um, Interesting. Yeah, I was cooking in like uh, duck fat and camel fat for a while. There's a lot of different fats people could use for uh, cooking eggs or whatever. <laughs> yeah, but I, I just decided that all that stuff is not real. Like all that, all those arguments about saturated fat and it's good for you, I don't buy it. Um, not for me, right? Um, yeah, so... I, I'm not, I'm not a fan. Yeah. Interesting. Fan. What are your thoughts on like total cholesterol? Because, um, the late, uh, the wild oregano guy, Dr. Cass Ingram that I had on my show before he was saying when people got below a certain number of cholesterol, he like, like vegans or vegetarians, he was afraid of them having a myocardial infarction, you know, or I don't buy it. I don't really? Buy it. Wow. No, no, that's <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, look, you got to really like uh, veganism, I don't think is a healthy diet, right? However, the whole Colin Campbell movement and like forks over knives and, and China study and all that stuff, I, I do think, if you ask me my opinion, I do think that these vegans have lower cardiovascular disease. Uh, and, and again, that there's, there's studies to back it up. And I think that that has to do, there's a lot of like, especially if they have like a whole food plant-based diet, I do think they have lower cardiovascular disease. There's a lot of anecdotes. There's a lot of things, but there's not only cardiovascular disease, <laughs> number one. And I think there's also ways to have low risk of cardiovascular disease while still consuming animal foods. And, and, you know, the vegans will say, no, that's not possible. So I, I'm definitely don't buy into the veganism. But whenever there's too many absolutes of like, no, the veganism is terrible in every way and there's no benefits and nobody does well in it. And 100 percent of people are, are going to be sick on it. Like that's too absolute. Right. If it was really that absolute, they, nobody would be doing it except the diehard uh uh, animal rights people, but it's pretty much, I, I do think there's some merits, probably cardiovascular disease would be that. And they've done studies on it. Right. And, but I think there's other problems with it. And, um, I, you yeah. know, I, 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 it doesn't work for me. I'll tell you that much. I would be very, in a very bad shape with it. I tried it out. I have a fruitarian I friend, had, Joe. Oh yeah. He's really smart, especially with genetics, but I, I haven't seen his teeth in years. I don't know how his dental health is going, but he's very smart. He's fruitarian. So yeah. it's interesting. Interesting. No, I think fruitar I don't think he could be too healthy on a fruitarian diet though. That's that's way too wacky. I mean, 
but that's not a real thing. Nobody's really, I haven't seen anyone really advocating for a fruitarian diet, except like some really wacky people. You're in therapy, people. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I mean, you're, there might be something to the urine stuff. I, I wouldn't dismiss that. Completely. They use it in cosmetics, but urea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's some, it's got antibacterial properties. Who knows? But uh, there's, um, oh, I had Colin Campbell on my pat- podcast. All the vegan, like that was the, the worst rated show ever because all the vegans were like, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. Like I was the only guy that brought him on and started like, char- you know, uh, challenging him. I'm like, wow. he's like, you know, whole food, plant-based diet. I'm like, dude, I did a whole food, plant-based diet exactly how you said. And I felt sick and worse than ever. He's like, no, it can't be. <laughs> it's not possible. <laughs> did, did you ever, is, and I know a lot of people like that too. Were you eating a lot of beans at one point, Joe? Because I, I feel amazing eating beans. Not all day long, but just once a day or twice a day. You're not lactose sensitive. That's why. <laughs> of course you do. Uh, no, I, I, yeah, I've tried beans. I've tried no beans. I've tried everything. I've, I've, I've mega dosed on every type of bean you could think about. <laughs> yeah because the soluble fiber thing's interesting there's like a, a bean diet woman out there that's saying uh it, it lowers adrenaline you know otherwise it just recirculates if you're deficient in fiber it's fascinating i mean yeah it's, uh, i don't know man <laughs> I don't think it, the bean diet person should meet the fruitarian <laughs> Should meet the uh, carnivore. We should have them all in one room. <laughs> uh, this is a good question, Joe. Uh, and we kind of, you know, touched on it. But your thoughts on epigenetics, and can we heal our DNA? So, in other words, could we just drink ayahuasca and uh, heal our mutations? No, I'm just <laughs> exactly. No, I, I would phrase it slightly differently. But yes, the if the. Per- the answer is you can counteract your genetic weaknesses through epigenetics, but everything you do is changing your gene expression. Mm. Okay, awesome. Yeah, because I think there is like, when I was heavy into the new age, there was this idea that you could like actually change your DNA with like meditation and visualization and, and stuff. The DNA itself? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, only vaccines can do that. There's no, I don't know of any other way. Vaccines and CRISPR. Right. The vaccine part is a joke. Yeah. Yeah, I had, I had COVID twice. I'm curious your thoughts on this, Joe. Like, I was kind of self-conscious because I, you know, the first time I got it earlier this year, I was down and out for three days. And the second time I got it, it was like a month later. I was down and out for about five, six days and just like full body fatigue, like never felt that way ever, with the cold or a flu. So it was something new. Um, but I, it made me look at myself, like self-reflect, not in like an overly judgmental way, but like, Hmm, doing all this stuff. What's the deal? Is it vitamin D deficiency? And, you know, I wouldn't, uh, reflect too hard on COVID because, I mean, there, there's a lot of, so there is a lot of things that can make you more vulnerable based on your genetics. We can't have a COVID report because the FDA would come down our ass, but we had one and we got rid of it just because it's too high risk. And uh, yeah, we, it was just, uh, but so we can't do a COVID report, even though that would be a good one. But uh, we do, you can look up individual SNPs right? This is a good place to look up individual SNPs. And that's exactly what I did. And I was like high risk for pretty much everyone I looked up, like 80% of them. And I, I like, I'm very high risk for COVID. I don't know, based on my genetics. It's very clear. Uh, based on my blood type too, O has lower risk. A plus is the highest risk. So I'm A plus. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I was, uh, coming into it and, you know, I'm going to be high risk for COVID here. I, I already knew that. 
So I, I um, you know, I have a pharmacy in my house already with all this stuff. And, and I just, I just was like throwing everything but the kitchen sink at it. And, and I actually came out fine. From it. So meaning like I didn't really, it wasn't that bad, but I know I would have been hit hard as hell if I, if I didn't really do a lot of the stuff that, you know, that I did. And there's a couple of good things like acetylcarnitine is really good for it. Um, thymine is actually good for it too. If you type in thymine in COVID, you'll see. Uh, I actually recommended thymine to someone who had long COVID and said it's really, really important. Uh, but they want to, there's, uh, they want to do some trials on that. And I'm, ha- I'm happy I got my thymine. Like I did some research on it before. I'm happy I did that because I think I would have been knocked out really hard. Yeah. The hyperbaric oxygen really helped me. Cause I think I had the long COVID thing and just, to Oh, use that's my, really my, good. The two atmosphere pressure of hyperbaric and, and I was doing rectal ozone and methylene blue and everything I possibly could <laughs> at once. I was doing <laughs> methylene blue too. <laughs> I, hyperbaric would have been a good one if I had access to it. But that's a good one. I like that. It's yeah. probably one of the best things you could do for COVID, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. And I just learned about like, uh, like Doris Lowe's really big in like high dose uh, ascorbic acid or just consistent ascorbic acid use and uh, melatonin for COVID. And I guess they work together, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. I um, took everything when I had COVID. <laughs> like I was, I, I literally was taking just like a whole bunch of stuff. Boom, boom. And, <laughs> I'm happy that I got it like later. I only got it like three months ago. Mm-hmm. So, you know, because if I would have gotten the beginning or I wouldn't, have been, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the same. I don't know. It, I just wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have known what to do as well. Yeah. Um, I don't want to keep you too long, Joe, but just a few more if it's, if that's cool with you. And uh, sure. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you one more like controversial thing. I don't know if you've been hearing about this, but the terrain versus germ theory, like battle that's been going on. And it's getting to the point where like certain doctors are saying cells don't exist. DNA doesn't exist. Never. Wait, what's the battle? The battles versus, uh, was it Pasteur and Bechamp, like terrain theory versus germ theory? Because the last two years, you know, with all these restrictions and, mandates and uh you know quarantines i think people in the health community are getting so frustrated that they're just saying this is all made up you know basically covid is not real it doesn't exist they've never isolated a virus viruses aren't real you know but they're just taking it to such an extreme level to where i don't know if you heard of this but i'm just like everything is not a conspiracy like i don't know i don't know like (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you got to understand the way I think about it. I, I'm I'm very skeptical of alternative stuff and very skeptical of mainstream stuff. I just I kind of am just this very skeptical person, <laughs> and and so you know, you look at me, you might be like, oh, this guy's a buy. He's taking a hundred supplements. He's like looking at all these things. You know, you might you might think I'm like. Okay, not in the mainstream camp, but in certain things, I'm very skeptical of of the alternative, right? I think both of them can go too far or be too dogmatic. So I tend to I tend to not believe in uh, I, I tend to not believe in in uh, a lot of this stuff in terms of COVID is not real. I mean, I I look at uh, if I'm not sure, I, I, I just, I, I more like lean on my observations and it's very clear that out of the people I know, I know, you know, everybody I know got COVID. It's a very different virus than a flu. I don't, I don't think you can, I don't see how you would deny that. It's um, very different and it's, it's, it's more harmful. It's just mm-hmm. based on all my observations so I'm not sure where people are coming from, but based on my observations, and I, I use the same approach with the vaccines. Like I look at 
the people I know who got vaccinated and I, <clears throat> I see, you know, what are the negative effects from it? And I think it's blown out of proportion because I, I you know, I, what I know, 500 people have gotten vaccinated. I don't know anybody who had side effects after like two, three days, not a single person. Now I've yeah. heard stories from, you know, some brothers, mothers, sisters who read on the internet that, <laughs> You know, this person got a vaccine and, you know, they died six months later. <laughs> I don't know what the, I don't have their medical charts. I don't know what else they had. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. My, my close friend's parents, they got the vaccine and they were saying that, uh, like their, their dad was sick for like a week and, and he was fine before that. So it's interesting. For, for a week. Okay. Fine. And then after a week. <laughs> was he sick from it three months, uh, six months later? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it was fine, but yeah, it's interesting to hear like anecdotal stories of people close to you. That's kind of, I, I no, but uh, you got to look at the people who, you know, because if you look at like, if you just hear stories, you don't know what the metal rec medical records are. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just, so like a lot of in, in these situations where I just don't know about, or, you know, I'm skeptical of like both, you know, obviously the mainstream was too much of, you know, there's no absolute zero problems with the vaccines or like no side effects. And it's this miracle cure for everything. Um, and then the other side is like, everybody's dying. We're going to, you know, half the population is going to die in like six months. You know, you just got to, <laughs> I don't know, you got to, I, I just look at, you know, what are the facts here? Right. Yeah. Um how to prevent passing a gene you don't want to your children Is that possible uh crispr <laughs> <laughs> it's the only way i mean if you, if, well, you if, can... if, if the parents like optimize before they you know conceive that's like like get labs done and you know do all the stuff and take all no, the right I don't think that... that helps no but the no, it doesn't help with the, the inheriting a gene, but they they they've done genetic engineering in embryos. It's it's a thing. They can do it. Uh, I don't think they're going to do it for something like MTHFR, but they <laughs> it could be done, right? They no, I, I mean they don't. I, I don't think they do genetic engineering. So what you can do if somebody's like really into this stuff you can like you can have multiple you know multiple successful embryos or sperm whatever and you could test the dna at that point and see which which of those has the dna of whatever it is and then not use that if, if it comes out now they typically do that for like stuff like I don't know, eye color or something like that. I, you know, that would be interesting if somebody did it for like MTHFR. <laughs> yeah, des designer babies is like the the term, right? right. Yeah, <laughs> it's probably going to be more common over time. I just, you know, right now they're not. I I don't know unless you want to. I mean, they did it. They they used CRISPR on those those Chinese kids, and the guy got arrested. So if you, they want to do that, that's also an option, but I don't but, think that's legal anywhere. When I used to uh, teach at juvenile hall, I would bring in cool like Nova documentaries for the kids or specials and Michio Kaku always had fun stuff. And uh, there was one where he was talking about in the future, we'll be able to have like reptile skin, like change our <laughs> genetics with like a CRISPR machine and people could have like horns or, anything they want in their body <laughs> <laughs> yeah it might be true i don't know yeah they could. no i i do think at some point that, that that could be done it's just that it's gonna take a long time because for every gene they change they have to do a bunch of safety testing and it takes a really long time hmm. they're not gonna like do that safety testing if it's something like growing horns. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever see the movie that the Island of Dr. Moreau That's one of my, fa my family favorites. No, I haven't seen it. 
this doctor is like it's a really old movie they're creating like chimeras like human animal hybrids on an island and then the experiment goes wrong and they start being uh violent <laughs> sounds like an interesting movie though. <laughs> yeah marlon brando oh, there's yeah. a remake that was the good one it was, old. It was like, marlon brando it's like a 90s movie but, but um interesting <laughs> That's also the name of Mike Pence's uh, pet rabbit, I think. <laughs> uh, I'm not even kidding. <laughs> this might be the last one. Uh, androgenic alopecia. This is a big, I get asked about this all the time. Like male baldness. Like, what have about? you ever looked into that? Have you ever looked into like solutions? Like I know there's like red light therapy and all these different things. Yeah, there's uh, well, there's Propecia and hair trends. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. There's there's definitely a lot of uh, so I actually just did a post on this. I do think that hair loss is uh, one of those things that is a sign of of not optimal health. Early hair loss, especially. And, uh, you know, cardiovascular disease, like you can look it up. There's different conditions that are so insulin resistance, blood pressure. Because when you have blood flow to the scalp, uh, it, 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 you get nutrients there, it's much less likely you're going to go bald. So there is a genetic predisposition, that's for sure. Uh, we had a report on self-decode. It didn't pass our quality assurance, so we took it off, but we might put it back on if we could find a better model. But there, there's definitely a genetic predisposition there. I think there's, uh, and there's definitely a lifestyle. So, you know, being healthy, like having good blood pressure, good circulation, uh, you know, there's certain herbs too that are, you know, having anti like low inflammation, good blood sugar profile, you could, uh, you could delay it, right? I mean, are you going to delay it to your 100? I don't, probably not, but you can delay it. I, obviously, DHT has an impact. There are some herbs that are DHT inhibitors, uh, like EGCG, green tea. Stuff like that. Yeah, I, mean, I think I was talking to a friend yesterday, and they were saying um, usually the teeth, gums, eyes, hairs, nails, these are the things that go first, usually south, like when you're when you're dealing with a health condition. I thought that was an interesting theory. That is, I mean, that is a good, yeah, th that's definitely true. So skin, teeth, hmm. nails. Um, gums, all that stuff is, it could be proxies for, let's put it this way. Anything that somebody finds unattractive is a proxy for negative health. Bad <laughs> right? breath. I just saw your post on that. This <laughs> Bad breath. Exactly. If, if uh, white hairs, I mean, if you see a girl with white hairs, are you like, I'm very attracted to that at best? you're you're just not it's not attractive it's a sign of aging right and people who have these signs earlier are you know it, it's uh it's a sign of not being optimal right so anything you're not attracted to it's kind of like a good rule overweight not attractive right uh, i i don't know if you could say that these days but it's just that that's where that's the fact <laughs> not attractive not healthy. Um, I mean, anything that you find not attractive, like let's say if somebody, even if a girl's not overweight, uh, you know, if I find that there's too much flab and, and they're not toned, unattractive. And guess what? That's not healthy either, right? Cellulite, not attractive, not healthy. Um, I mean, if it, or from a girl's perspective, if they see a guy that is built and, and is carved and looks healthy, um, if someone's too pale, does that is, is that healthy looking? Not usually not, right? Uh, you know, people like a tan, 
again, somebody's getting more sun. All these things are, you know, wrinkles. If it's a good sign, if you, if you're not like, if you have less wrinkles, you're more likely to be healthy, right? Optimally healthy. So all these signs of aging, yes, they're going to eventually happen if you're, you know, hundred or, or just over time, right? Like nobody is a hundred and doesn't have any wrinkles and no white hair <laughs> and they have, it has all their hair. But if you're 30 and you're getting a bunch of white hairs and you're overweight, right? I mean, that's a sign of not optimal health. It's just that. It's awesome. Well, uh, well, this was a lot of fun, Joe. I think that's a, a good place to wrap it up. And um, so you have getjoe.co for your supplements. You have selfdecode.com. And are you planning on opening up the, um, like if someone wants to do what I'm doing and speak with a practitioner and really dial stuff in, is that going to open up at some point this it year? It is, yeah. People are... People can already do that, and and we're gonna we're gonna expand that more. And yeah, I think it really it, it goes well with uh you know with uh I I think the the personalized stuff, the personalized health with DNA is gonna start taking off in a in a much bigger way because I think it's it's just too significant to ignore, and I, I you know it's it. Right now, it's still something like early adopters, but I think it's it's taking off more and more, right? And I do think that some people need help. That's where the consults come in. Uh, and, you know, we don't, you know, whether, uh, I, I think with, you know, if you're selling good quality supplements, right? I don't, I don't see, people can still buy those individual ingredients and look at what they need more of, right? And it's like, hey, if I need more vitamin D, I should, you know, you could tell your audience, check out if you have this variant, if you have it, you should get this vitamin D, right? Yeah. And, that, and so I think I that's going to. I need to in-depth read the VDR and all the blogs you have because I'm trying to, I guess it's not black and white, but the whole VDR mutation thing is like, it can either increase or decrease your need for vitamin D. I'm kind of blurry on that right now. But we do have a vitamin D report in general. So, I mean, you could you could go deeper and, and like link to a specific post and be like, if you have this variant, then it means you need to take this, you know, check your vitamin D levels or, mm. if, and, you know, if, you, if it's not this level, you need to buy the supplement, right? Uh, you could do that with, the, with a bunch of stuff. How does this relate to, especially once you can easily search for whatever it is, be like, okay, what is this? related to and that, that's going to come out in like two weeks uh probably when this podcast is going to be out i don't know how long this takes but next friday like or this no this okay. friday yeah yeah this friday <laughs> it'll be out uh I, I, you know exactly when i'm not sure but it'll be out in, within a few weeks and um yeah so i think that it, it's just people will i think people need to shift in how they're thinking to do stuff in a personalized way and, and track the results with lab tests rather than just, you know, like, I don't know, every, every week follow a new guru who's going to tell you something else like vegetable oils, you know, there's nothing worse than that in the world or, and, and with the vegetable oils too, you can look at if you have higher levels of different fatty acids. So we tell you what levels you have for all the different kinds of fatty acids. So, I actually have higher arachidonic acid and omega-6, mm. which is why I actually um, scrutinize my omega-6s more after reading that. But, you know, it, it's it's just, again, it's like I, I learn things every week, right? It's it's really cool. I, I, I think I'm a, I'm a huge fan. That's why I got into this. It, it's really fun. Yeah, and especially if you're into biohacking. I mean, if you're dealing with a, a serious thing, then you probably want to work one on one with someone. But um, for for someone like us, I think it's just uh, it's like Disneyland. Right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's just like exactly. You're just like, oh, is it, what's going on here? I could do this experiment, or I should try this supplement. It came up as that you know, I need more of it. So one thing I just realized, and I just I just did it. 
I, you can upload your labs. Uh, Correct. And, and what does that change the blogs or what, what does that do? Or It changes the reports a bit. So it'll show you what your labs are in various reports. Oh, cool. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of I, cool stuff. My hematocrit is slightly out of range, it looks like. Uh, it's like it's higher than normal. Yeah. So, so we'll have a, uh, I don't, we, we have that as a lab test, but we'll release it as a report in the next uh, month. Oh, cool. Awesome. All the lab tests we're releasing as reports. So, you're, you're able, we already have like 20, over 20, uh, 25, I'm not sure exact number, but basically what the idea there is you could see what your predisposition is. And if you have, let's say your predisposition is low, but you have high levels, then that means that there's something in your environment that is causing it to be high, right? So that's why it's, for me, I think it's super interesting to see what is my predisposition and uh, what is, you know, what, what, what is, uh, what is my actual result? So I had, um, I had a, I, my blood urea and nitrogen was always lower in my lab tests when I, when I first started taking it. All of a sudden I started to, you know, eat like a carnivore diet. My blood urea and nitrogen went up like crazy. Right. Wow. And that's not necessarily such a bad thing. Right. I mean, there's some correlations, but I don't know if they're causal, but in my genetics, it says my blood urea and nitrogen is, is lower which is true before I started the carnivore diet. <laughs> so that's kind of where it comes in that, you know, you, it's just an example I thought about where I have like a lower predisposition, but a much higher level. So you, you'll see that sometimes. So that's really cool to know what your genetic predisposition is and where your actual levels are. So are you eating mostly a carnivore diet now, Joe? Are you doing how, like how many meals a day and steaks? Or? Yeah, I do mostly carn. I've been doing a carnivore diet before carnivore came out, like a type. I, I still, so I don't buy into the whole vegetables are bad things. So I eat vegetables. I've, I've been doing that. I still do that. And I'm against doing a carnivore diet in the way that the 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 zealots are promoting it meaning like i've been doing this for the past seven years or no longer now eight years right um and it's just that the way that they're promoting it is like you know you don't need vitamin c <laughs> it's just like you know you all you need is like, you know, stomach, <laughs> gut, <laughs> consume like the gut of the animal and you'll get all the, but like, I don't know, you know, I think that it's not ideal for certain nutrients, number one. And I think you need to consume vegetables. It's just, yeah, I don't I know. Felt horrible um, not eating fiber because I did like a low fiber right. experiment. I felt really bad. Yeah, it's it, I mean, you need it. it. I mean, you could butyrate all these things is, is from is fiber. I mean, uh, technically, you could, you know, you could do resistant starch, and that will help out a lot. But I, I think you can. There's ways to do a carnivore diet without vegetables, but you really have to know what you're doing. And I don't think any of these people know what they're doing. It's just it's seriously, like I, I've done all the research and experiments, so I would know how to do it. And I would recommend it to certain people like Michaela Peterson. She needed, she needs a carnivore diet. Right. And by the way, FYI, um, it was funny. She came on, I, I had her on as a guest on the podcast before anyone really knew about her. Uh, because she, I mean, she started doing the carnivore diet and I was like, I have to check one thing. Like if you have the lectin sensitivity gene, <laughs> And she had the same variants as me, which only had like 3% of the population had. So oh. that was kind of like, okay, you know, 
Like I've, I've looked at this with all my clients and I've noticed, an, you know, I've noticed this and that was like, okay, I could see this. Right. So she's probably, she's definitely got a lot of things going on there. Right. More than just the lectin sensitivity. And, um, I think she needs the diet, right? It's a medication for her, but other people don't. Like, I, I would say that it's something that maybe 1% of the population should use as medication. Same with the ketogenic diet. Certain people that should use it as like a, a medical treatment, but you have to know what you're doing. You can't do a ketogenic diet and not know what you're doing. Same with the carnivore diet. You got to know what you're doing. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I have an increased need for methionine. I know that could potentially be inflammatory, but if I have an increased need for it, then it's going to be different. I also have an increased need for it. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah, methionine, (laughs) the thing is, is that that would be a reason to consume more animal foods. I also have an increased need for leucine. I have higher leucine. I don't know what that what that means for uh, uh mine is also higher <laughs> let me see if higher levels higher levels yeah. yeah uh that means i don't need as yeah, much so, right correct so you need more methionine less leucine so i get the same results um i was wondering what this meant also <laughs> until i read <laughs> no i clicked on it you got to read it <laughs> Um, so it says leucine, okay, leucine, uh, let's see, high leucine levels may result in, well, may result from, uh, obesity, supplementation, obesity. Oh, here, high, here's why it comes up as a negative, like a bad face, a, a sad face. So. High leucine levels can may increase inflammation and are linked to higher risk of diabetes. That's why. Low, loose, low leucine levels may contribute to poor muscle function. So now I've got really good muscles. I'm assuming that part of that has to do with high leucine, but it, uh, it can deregulate sugar. So if I don't take care, like if I don't pay attention to that, my fasting blood glucose is higher. It probably has to do with the leucine. See, I just learned something new now. <laughs> there you go. So I, I learn new stuff every week. Yeah. I'm just like, yeah. oh, what's going on here? <laughs> I've done so many like veganism stints that I wasn't getting like vitamin A, leucine, or methionine for like long, like years, periods of time. <laughs> so Yeah, but so not. it turns out that you don't need as much leucine, but you do need the methionine, right? Mm. And 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 like your report said, you need the vitamin A. So, yeah, you weren't getting probably enough vitamin A. I don't I don't know what to think of vitamin A though, because it is hard to be deficient. Although you you still could like you, you still could do better with higher vitamin A, which I think you're one of those people, right? Do you, do you notice an impact with like if you're taking a lot of cod liver and you felt good in it, probably from the vitamin A. So, so I found this company, Rosita. I think it's the best. Uh, they're in Norway, uh, and they have like a special process of processing. They're called the Royal. Um, and uh, talk about mega. But it gets rancid. No, but it gets rancid very quickly, though. I, yeah, if you I think, think Omega 6 gets rancid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Omega 3 is the, the king of rancidity. They, they put like a little bit of rosemary in it and like, um, uh, I know mm-hmm. the gel caps, like when it's encapsulated, it you know it's less prone because you know oxygen doesn't hit it like the liquid version. So right. they sell both, like capsules and liquid. But uh, I mean, talk about megadosing, Joe. Like you said, I went crazy. Like people were afraid. That, like how much cod liver oil? You... I was just drinking from the bottle, like swigs, and uh, I was probably going through a bottle of theirs every like four days. And but my body was just asking for more. I just felt incredible, and I was taking vitamin E wow. to balance it and K two, you know, because it has A right. and D in there. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to take E and K two to balance it. But I just felt like my brain lit up. It felt like a nootropic. Um, what did you get for DHA and EPA? 
in in South Dakota. On the wellness reports. Yeah. Uh, Research. How fun is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, typical like levels, it. typical levels, okay. <laughs> DHA, no, and typical, then EPA. Typical well, levels. mine is high levels of DHA, and and I'll tell you, okay. what did you get for EPA? Typical, but my omega three is increased need, and I have a higher omega six uh, to omega three ratio. Oh, okay. So there you go. Um, I have, uh, let's see, I get higher levels of EPA and DHA. So I have typical need for omega-3. So I took, and I don't have any increased need. So this is a great example of, you know, my genes versus your genes, right? I took a shit ton of cod liver. And I thought I was going to, like, I, like, if you just flicked me, I'd get a bruise. I was, because my, my, my levels were just way too high. And I took a blood test. My platelets went down to 94. Wow. <laughs> I was like, and I was like, I, I'm, you know, I felt like if, if anything, if, if somebody ever like smacked me in the face, I would be dead. Like, I don't know. It was just too much. So, and I wasn't even taking cod liver oil. I was taking this, uh, it was cod liver, just cod liver. Mm. It wasn't the oil. Like there was canned, oh. I, I just liked the taste. So I was eating a lot of it. <laughs> it's less concentrated and, is how I understand. It's the same stuff. Yeah, but yeah, the much less like... concentrated. Exactly. But it was way too much omega-3s. And uh, like, I think part of that is because I have naturally high levels. Like I do really well on omega-3s, but I can't take more than a gram a day because I think I have naturally high levels. Whereas, wow. and then my vitamin A, I didn't need it. Like uh, naturally, I think I have good levels of vitamin A and that, that, that can maybe cause me to have uh, lower K2. Whereas you were having lower vitamin A and lower omega-3s and you're just taking this and it's like, oh, this is really good for me, right? Now I wouldn't do that forever, but <laughs> you know, uh, for a time it was helping you. Whereas it had the opposite effect on me. I was like, this is, you know, and, and so I looked at my lab markers. I looked at my symptoms. I looked at, you know, now I can look at my genetics. And so that's kind of how I see the future of health. You, you, you look at everything. The, the lab marker that I looked at was platelets. My platelets were always at like 200, uh, between a little less, on average 200. All of a sudden it went to 90 which is like super low, right? You don't want it at 90, it's dangerously low almost. Um, like the, the, the minimum level is 150. So it went down, it went okay. from 200, which is an optimal level to 90. And so that's like, you look at the lab marker, you look at your symptoms, you look at your genetics. That's, that's the way to do it. What's interesting, Joe, is I pulled up a, the, I searched in blogs for omega threes, and there was one post. The link between genetics and omega three with the ELOVL two gene, and then it has the personalized SNP table, and it says on all three of them with the my genotypes that associated with roughly average DHA levels, which is why I wonder why it says so, increase. Need. Oh, so I'll t let me explain that to you. That's an important piece. When you look at the blog post, they're looking at a specific gene. So reading the blog posts are to basically come up with hypotheses, right? It's not telling you what the overall result is. That's why we don't put an overall result there. We just give you content. We tell you what your SNPs are, and then you can come up with the conclusions. So we, we but again, that's why I'm telling you that like, what these other companies are doing is basically like that blog post. They're looking at a couple SNPs and they're, they're making broad conclusions. We're not making broad conclusions. We're just saying, here's what the studies show. You could click on the, the references. You'll see that's the study show. But if you want to look at a conclusion, like a genetic predisposition, you want to look at the reports. That makes sense. 
Okay, cool. Yeah, because I I sent a bunch of people to your website the other day, and I think everyone's just like trying to learn how to do it on their own. So, so this uh, this podcast will be great. It's kind of an intro of how to how to explore it. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, this was fun. this was a lot of fun, Joe. Um, appreciate you uh, sharing your genetics uh, wisdom. And, um, yeah, I look forward to more updates. I mean, you guys are constantly uploading new, um, new health reports, right? Like almost every week. Yeah. Yeah. We got new stuff coming out all the time. Yeah. It was, it was it. a lot of fun. Cool. Well, a lot uh, of fun. I think this is my longest podcast. I've been on. <laughs> <laughs> we, we kept going fun. on a lot of tangents, but, uh, it was great. Yeah. I think we, you should probably <laughs> split this into like three episodes or something. <laughs> Do you normally have like this yeah. long? I mean, I think my my record was like four hours, but I was pretty taxed oh, wow. after that. I needed to like a couple and you, stakes. You released the whole thing in one shot. <laughs> yeah. Joe Rogan now. <laughs> I love it. But yeah, I, I agree. I think this is going to blow up in popularity and people are going to be more interested in, you know, personalized uh, healthcare. And I'm sure it's going to get a lot of flack at the same, same rate as growth where people are going to say it's all BS, but I mean, what's all BS genetics, genetics genetics testing and like for your (laughs) personalized, like supplementation and dieting. But I mean, I was telling Tyler when I had him on the show, uh, I have an increased tendency for hoarding because you could search hoarding on this. (laughs) <laughs> and what's funny is my girlfriend laughs at me. We'll go to the supplement store. I can't just buy one if I want to try. I buy like three or six of like a buy. You know, I know. I'm the same way. I also got high marks on hoarding. <laughs> 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 I, that's definitely genetic. My whole family is like hoarders. <laughs> I, I like to call it prepping, but yeah. <laughs> right. I When I buy supplements, I also buy like, oh, I got I to gotta buy the whole, you know, I got to buy like three of them. I, I've got like a, a 360 day supply of every supplement that I need. I'm the same way. I have a I have a supplement closet that uh, my girlfriend organized for me, and it's all like easy to see now. But we had to go and buy like the organizers. And everything. So she's also into all this stuff. Oh yeah, we send girlfriend? each other studies, and uh, she's she's actually visiting again. She she lives far, kind of far away, hours away, and uh, um. She's, we're probably going to go through our self to code together when she visits. It's going to be fun and look at our, uh, cause I think we have a lot of things in common with our health reports. It's kind of interesting. Right. So right. We go to the, go to the same restaurants. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> but, some of the uh, traits yeah, can be fun. D- some, some of the traits stuff ahead, can Joe. be fun. fun. No, I was just saying some of the trade stuff could be fun. Yeah. What did you get yeah, for I think we both have aggression? <laughs> oh, I think mine was, I think my irritability and aggression was high. Let me see. I'm getting better, but. Uh, my irritability and aggression. Are oh, less, so high. less likely to be aggressive, but I think irritability. Oh. I was thinking, I was like, you don't seem like an aggressive guy. I would, I would have guessed uh, lower, but irritability, you can't know based on a podcast. Yeah, likely higher irritability. I think that's why I live away from people because I don't have to do That deal makes with sense. People. That makes sense. Oh, for sure. <laughs> I'm like you, by the way. The only thing is that I've, I've hacked it. So, like, I, I, when I was like, uh, when I didn't hack my mood, I was I, I, like, I want to live in the middle of nowhere. So I lived in the middle of nowhere for a year. And then I was like, I got to get out of the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, it could kind of make you crazy. Like there were times where I, you know, I was living alone for long periods. And I've heard stories up here where I lived where like the first house I bought here, um, the guy was telling me that lived around it. He's like, yeah, I lived by myself up here for eight years and didn't have a woman. And I was starting to go stir crazy. And uh, you know, <laughs> I bet. develop a lot of symptoms, and it's kind of like being an astronaut in space in a way. I mean, it's really um, sure it's not healthy or natural. It's interesting. 
<laughs> Interesting. What did you get for openness to experience? Openness to experience. I got to look at all those categories. I didn't know this were yeah, look likely at more open, look. like likely more open to experience. Same with me. I would, I mean, I would guess that I, uh, about you also. I mean, trying out a whole bunch of supplements. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you name it. I, I think I saw you have lithium in your supplement. I, you know, I kind of make a dose that for a while for, you know, several weeks. I, was, I think I was taking like 50 milligrams of lithium or and uh, it was interesting. 50 milligrams? <laughs> How many? Yeah, like 50 milligrams a day lithium. Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's kind I of... didn't even sell 50 that you had to, like, you took a bunch of pills. Yeah, I think I bought the 10 milligram and I would just, you know, and take you a bunch five. of five. Oh, nice. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. It's really it may good. be interesting. Let me look up lithium. Oh, it's just a lithium test. I don't think there's a wellness report on it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's so many supplements to experiment with. So, <laughs> how do you do on the alcohol? Alcohol uh, sensitivity, it's in the traits. I'm going to guess it's low. Let me search alcohol sensitivity. Well, it's not oh, necessarily. You might be surprised. Because... Likely typical sensitivity. Typical sensitivity. Okay, that makes sense. Says, well, I mean, you have the same. It's hard to know. The same as same as ninety three percent of the users. That's what I'm saying. It's hard to know. I have increased sensitivity, and I'm I'm pretty sure that I I have increased sensitivity. But that's what I'm saying. It's it's hard to know based on because you know if you don't do well on alcohol, it could you know welcome to the rest of the world, right? Like I mean, it's just most of the people. I mean, it's just that. You have more or less compared to some other people. It seems like you're typical. Yeah. Uh, based on. I wanted to pull up my. Uh, I had a little genetics call with Tyler on the side. He was saying. Uh, I have something with my endo. He said my endocannabinoid tone is lower. Uh, reduced surface okay. receptor expression. CB1 receptor. I have reduced expression. It's funny because I, I used to be a delivery driver and I worked at a brick and mortar and I was never a stoner. I was more into the CBD when people were doing like THC dabs in the back room with the dispensary. I was like, you got this, the CBD? Like, yeah, <laughs> like CBD, which is, it's a ton of CBD at once. I don't think that's, that would be my preferred way of ingestion now, but uh, yeah. Are you, sense. are you more of an introvert or an extrovert? Uh, I would say introvert, but I think self-decode says I'm more extroverted. Um, and the, Interesting. Yeah, and the genetic you avatar seem... says extrovert. Oh, interesting. It's You seem more extroverted to me just based on what we're talking, you know, how we're talking. But who knows? It's a tendency, yeah. so... It might have been my be. old self because I, I used to be I it, it was hard to get into. I had to take like public speaking and drama and theater like I like forced myself to break out in community college. It was just like, let me do all the uncomfortable classes. And I think that helped just like getting uh -huh. in front of large groups of people. So interesting. I think I forced the shift because most of my life up until college, I was an introvert for sure. Oh, but yeah, you could also just change over time, like based mm -hmm. on, I think most, you become more extra, like you can become more extroverted over time, like until college, you're not fully developed. I was a different person before I fully developed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, they, they do these studies on people who are like fully developed, each version and extra version, mm -hmm. typically interesting yeah. awesome. but that's a, like that's a big thing like you could be you know kind of a different person before college because you know you're not fully developed yeah i was a late bloomer for sure um oh i just realized you have the ancestry coming soon too i think that's fairly new yeah the ancestry is coming soon 
Okay. I have to start go, stop going to other websites because I'm waiting to get my results from another one. I don't know if I should name mm-hmm. them here, <laughs> but they have like a, a Viking DNA uh, option, which I'm really <laughs> curious about because cod liver oil was like a Viking thing largely. And I, I'm like, I bet I have a ton of Viking things. <laughs> I think I know what you're talking about, but. <laughs> yeah, um, they prob- probably sell the data. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure, but if if it's who I think, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know who it is. They probably don't, though. I don't, I don't think selling the data, like I said, is not as big of a problem if, if it's not the big companies, as much as actually just having good security. Mm. Okay, that's good to know. So just yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Because the ancestry thing is so interesting. Like I did twenty three and B in ancestry, and then this is the third one I did. I'll just say it's living DNA. <laughs> and okay, and uh, well, the, living DNA. Okay, yeah, I, I I'm aware of them. Okay, and I I did it just to have three things to go off because that my Italian genetics differed by 10% from 23andMe and Ancestry, which is kind of significant to me. That's a big change. You should uh, check ours out because we're actually following a patent on our Ancestry, which is why we haven't released it yet. Because once you use something commercially, you can't follow a patent on it. Oh, um, cool. When's that expected to launch? Once we file the patent, we'll we'll be able to. It's probably going to file the patent in like a month. It could take like another month, maybe a half a month. I don't know. Probably one and a half months, maybe two months to launch. I, I'm not sure exactly, but maybe I don't know. But uh, it depends exactly when we file the patent. But uh, we have uh, the best. Uh, it's, it's, we have the best uh, algorithm out there, and you're probably going to get different results now the algorithm is not the only thing like the more data you have the better the out the better the end result will be in certain ways but you will get like it will be interesting to see what our results are compared to the other ones that's wow yeah i bet yeah. that's going to open all sorts of doors too for uh all the other aspects of self-decode right making things more accurate or yeah so we already use that's another thing we didn't discuss but when you do polygenic risk scoring using ancestry makes it more accurate and that's why we did the ancestry to begin with besides you know people wanting it it, we decided that's actually important to make the health part more accurate so that's why we used it that's why we did it that's awesome yeah it'll be really interesting awesome joe we'll uh we'll end the uh (laughs) the marathon here (laughs) sounds good it was great talking coming on that was a really fun show to record i like how joe is a fellow megadoser of supplements that's not for everybody but for people that can handle it i think it could be helpful to share that data with others I've been really geeking out on this genetic stuff. And the next day after I recorded this talk with Joe, I actually had a consultation with one of the doctors on the self to code team. And it was really enlightening. It was really interesting to hear his perspective on my mutations. And he sent me over recommendations of different blood tests to get and different tests to see what's going on, different panels. And so I'll be sharing those results either here on the podcast and or the Mitolife Academy and what I'm currently doing to rebalance. Whether people like to admit it or not, I think most of us are dealing with chronic imbalances and dialing in the minerals, the vitamins, specific supplements is fun for me. And I'm well aware of the balance in life to go out and unplug and just walk around in nature without listening to music and really taking a break from studying and health optimizing. But it is important if we have specific goals. And I like what 
Joe's strategy is to pick just one goal and just stick with that for several months. I think that's a really logical approach. I'll put the link below where you can check out self decode. I signed up for premium. That's the membership tier that I definitely recommend. And like I said, the blogs are so fun, just endless things to learn, but the health reports where it just breaks down what you are more likely to be high in or you have a decreased need for or an increased need. That stuff is really interesting to me because you can easily experiment with it with supplements and food. I'll put a link below as well to the previous show I did with Dr. Tyler Pansner. And he also provides genetic consultations. And like I said earlier, it's not the end all be all of health optimization, but it's just one more piece of information that could help us to move forward in our health journey and actually make some progress. If you want to save some money signing up for self to code, you can use the discount code Blackburn to save a little bit and you will not regret it. I have trouble not spending hours on that website looking around. My website is matt-blackburn.com. I have my CLF protocol up there, recipes, and all of my recommended products if you click on shop. I want to make a shout out to Blue Shield. They just released a new series called Phi Series. And this is one of those technologies that gets a lot of flack because you can't measure anything with a meter. Therefore, you know, be skeptical about it. But what really sold me on Blue Shield years ago, I was at a health conference and I was really wiped out, just overworked, taking on other people's work and just feeling tired and slammed from EMFs. And this guy, Brian Miller, walks over and hands me the Blue Shield portable. And that was my first time experiencing it. It felt like an energetic shower. Like I showered without getting wet and I just felt immediately refreshed. And I went on my phone immediately and ordered one so that I wouldn't forget. And I've been using them ever since. So that was about four to five years ago. And it absolutely changed my life. I'm one of those people that felt sick the first couple days after plugging it in. I felt like I was coming down with a cold flu and then that passed and I felt amazing. And I've heard stories of people plugging them in and their roommate or their family members didn't know and they experienced those effects, which takes away the placebo, which means that it's actually real. And I've just heard too many testimonials from people like that that makes me look at these as a real technology. So it doesn't block or cancel out or dampen EMF signals. All it does is provide your body and your nervous system an anchor point that it could pay attention to instead of the stressful fields that you're exposed to. One of my first podcast episodes was with the U.S. distributor, Brandon Amalani of Blue Shield. Really knowledgeable guy. I love the tech and the gadgets, and there's not too many people that I trust in that space, um, especially the technologies that aren't plug-in. I'm really, really skeptical of the devices that aren't powered by electricity. So these devices are not pyramids or cones or something that you just sit on your desk on its own. You actually keep these plugged in and they actually do something. If I was traveling frequently, I would definitely be using their portable plug-in whenever I went to a hotel in combination with Stetsurizer filters. So check that out if you're interested in picking one of those up. Discount code BLACKBURN saves you 10%. And my brand is called MitoLife. You can find that at mitolife.co. And we just released a new beef liver supplement. And it's actually spiked with my favorite form of copper, copper bisglycinate. So you get B-complex vitamins, you get zinc, you get iron if you're dealing with iron deficiency but it's balanced with copper and zinc you have sodium potassium chromium choline coq10 so many nutrients in there beef liver was one of the things that 
helped me recover from several years of veganism and vegetarianism. And the capsules are just a really convenient and easy way to do it. And as I've teased before, by the end of the summer, we'll have a upgrade for the MitoLife products and one or two new products as well that are going to be released. So look forward to that. And I will see you guys next Friday. Stay supercharged.